The Fix-It Shop Written by Friedrich Wilhelm Narrated by Chris Abernathy Chapter 1 Spring 1982 It was March of 1982, the beginning of spring. I was in the tenth grade in high school, and already looking forward to the summer break. I would be turning sixteen in two months, so, like most teenage boys in my neighborhood, I always worked odd jobs during summer, trying to save money for my first car. My family lived in a small house in Clarksdale, Tennessee. The town was located just south of the Kentucky border, with a population of about 80,000 people. My family consisted of mom, dad, and seven kids, six boys and one girl. My brother Doug and I were the youngest. Our mom was possibly the hardest working woman I have ever known. She always worked two or more jobs. Even so, she didn't bring home a lot of money because she was paid miserably low wages. My dad rarely had steady work. He struggled with alcoholism and mental issues that were largely a result of his 13 years of military service during the war. It was always a challenge for our family to make ends meet. We had a neighbor, George Blick, who owned several acres of farmland on which he grew tobacco. He would hire my brother Doug and me each summer to help harvest his crop. Blick's crops and barns were located in the next county, about 30 miles away. I wasn't old enough to obtain a driver's license yet, and Doug was saving to buy his first vehicle, so we would carpool with George during tobacco cutting season. In 1982, the United States was in the midst of a recession. Ronald Reagan had just taken over the presidency from Jimmy Carter. Times were hard. Interest rates were 18% for a home mortgage, and the unemployment rate in Tennessee was hovering around 13%. The price of a gallon of gas was $1.35, but that was soon to go up with the so-called gas shortage. Because of the lack of jobs and cheap drugs entering the country from Mexico, our neighborhoods were becoming crime-ridden and dangerous. It was the time of Miami Vice, and cocaine was everywhere. George took a liking to Doug and me. Looking back, I believe he tried to shield us from the thugs and criminals on our city streets. He kept us busy as often as possible with various jobs on his farm and around his house. Our city was controlled by what some would regard a good old boy group of officials. It was a place with little opportunity unless you were part of this system. Our house was in an area of town that most would consider undesirable. It was a small house, especially with seven kids and two adults. All six of us boys shared one bedroom. I know that sounds unbearable, but looking back, that small room didn't really feel cramped. We were young and didn't know any different then. We had three bunk beds. Each bottom bed was designed to pull out and pop up, creating a third bed. The hardest part of living in such a small house with nine people was sharing only one bathroom. We moved into that house in 1970, when I was four years old. My parents purchased the house for $18,000. I can remember that it was in really bad shape. Truly, it was the worst-looking house in the neighborhood, with the ugliest lot you could imagine. The yard had been just as poorly maintained as the house. The grass was over my head the day we moved in. But we all pitched in and worked on the house and the yard to make them livable. It was all my parents could afford, with seven kids to feed, so we all did our best to make the most of what we had. The homes on our street were all similar. Built around 1950, roughly 1,200 square feet of living space, no garages. Our house had a full basement, but it was barely usable. The house sat on a steep hill that sloped down from the street. Whenever it rained, the water rushed into our yard, causing the basement to leak. I remember that we were never allowed to have indoor pets. They always had to stay outside. I guess with so many people living under one roof, we simply didn't have space for them inside. We would always keep the basement door open, though, so our dogs could have shelter from the rain and cold. The backyard sloped even steeper than the front. It ended in a dry creek bed. 
The yard was too steep for us to play in, but Dad was able to maintain a thriving garden there. The soil was rich, and he spent many hours tilling and weeding the garden so he could grow a variety of vegetables. We would harvest the results of his labors and send them in the deep freezer located in the basement. My dad loved to make a vegetable stew. He could spend hours at the dinner table drinking Pabst Blue Ribbon beer and cutting vegetables on his maple chopping block. If you were poor and lived in the South, the vegetable stew was a perfect dinner you could make in abundance for little money. And if an unexpected guest showed up for dinner, you would add another cup of water to the stew to have enough to feed your guest. The dinner table doubled as our weekly card game area. Saturday and Sunday nights, my dad would put away the chopping block and pull out a deck of cards. Gin Rummy was our game of choice. Those nights, we would rarely watch television. Instead, the whole family would play cards together. The competition was fierce. Dad had a large steel pot that he would load up with freshly popped popcorn and melted butter. We rarely had soda or any other store-bought beverages. We drank a lot of tea, though. It was cheap to buy and easy to prepare. In those days, nothing was better than a game of rummy, a bowl of hot buttered popcorn, and a glass of cold, sweet iced tea. Our neighborhood was one of the poorest areas in the city. Two miles to the west of our home was a large, low-income public housing complex. Four miles to the south was another public housing complex, and five miles to the east was yet another low-income housing project. Families living in poverty surrounded us. That spring of 1982, my brother, Doug, bought a Booger Green cargo van that had only two seats. He had just turned 17, so buying a vehicle meant he no longer needed to ride the school bus. Of course, the van wasn't in perfect condition, not by a mile. It had several dents, and the paint was faded and beginning to chip. It was the kind that had windows all the way around it. It sure wasn't pretty, but that monster ran just fine. The van was Doug's first vehicle. He was so proud of that thing that you would have thought he had just bought himself a brand new Corvette. My brother was a hard worker. He gave his all to everything he set his mind to. Obtaining his first vehicle without financial assistance from anyone made him proud. We had learned from being poor that... If we wanted anything in life, the only way we could get it was by working hard and saving our money. My mother was a good influence on Doug and me. Like many of German descent, she had a stubborn nature, was a hard worker, and paid attention to details. She was always on time and never missed work. As manager of three convenience stores in our town, there were times when an employee might call in sick and my mom would have to fill in for the employee until she could get another employee to relieve her. My mother had been involved in a convenience store robbery in 1980. On that particular day, she was called into work because an employee quit without notice. The store was located directly across the street from a public housing project. It suffered numerous thefts from some thugs who lived nearby, sometimes incurring substantial losses. That afternoon, they would clash with my mother and her German attitude. Three low-life individuals walked into the store and headed straight to the beer coolers. My mom noticed they were acting unusual. Something didn't feel right. Their eyes were shifting everywhere. They were nervous. She was certain that these were the three guys her employees told her had been loading up with beer and walking out of the store without paying. They chose the aisle next to the storefront windows as their getaway route. It was the closest path to the front doors. Mom was fully aware they were planning to escape without paying for the beer. She headed to the front door as they swaggered down the aisle with cases of beer under their arms. She locked the front door and ran back to the counter to call the police. The three thugs lost their cool and went ballistic over being locked in. They started kicking the front doors. They managed to shatter the glass and escaped with the stolen beer. The police arrived to ask questions and take a report from my mom. She gave a description of the robbers and what happened. The store surveillance camera captured the crime, 
so she was able to show the officers the footage. After getting as much information as they could to that point, the officers left the scene. But the store was still open for business. Mom had to stay there and wait for somebody from a glass company to replace the front door. No more than thirty minutes after the police officers left the scene, the three thugs returned. They showed up in the parking lot in front of the store. Mom was ringing up a sale on the cash register for the candy a little girl was buying. Just then, a flurry of bullets came crashing through the large storefront window that was only a couple feet from where my mother was standing. The little girl was lucky. She was so short that her head was below the counter. Mom was not as fortunate. She was hit with multiple shots on the left side of her face and body. They fired 21 rounds into that storefront window. Those worthless, degenerate punks intended to kill her. Police and fire rescue were called to the scene. My mother was conscious, but bleeding badly. She told me later that her only thought at the time was, if she died, who would take care of her family? She had seven kids, ranging from three years old to twenty-three, and knew our father could not handle the job of raising all of us by himself. Paramedics saved Mom's life that day. They were able to stabilize her until they could get her to the hospital. Her injuries were severe, but not mortal. It took quite some time for her to recover fully from all the bullet wounds. The three good-for-nothing would-be murderers were captured within twenty-four hours. My mother testified against them in court. All three of those bastards received only eighteen short months in prison. They didn't even get two years for shooting a mother of seven children twenty-one times with intent to kill. Their actual sentences were longer, but because of an overcrowded prison, the thugs were set free earlier for so-called good behavior. What a joke. I always wondered how many more stores did they rob after getting out. Did they eventually kill anyone? Hopefully each other. After Mom's traumatic experience and lengthy recovery period, earning extra money had become much more of a priority. With Mom not being able to work, the rest of our family needed to pitch in with the bills more than ever. Whatever money we could earn working odd jobs was valuable to our family. Big or small, we appreciated and accepted any job offered to us. My brother Doug had a great schedule at school, and to be honest, I was a little jealous. Back in 1982, our school offered a co-op program that allowed students in their junior year, who had good grades, to get out of school for a half a day to go to work. Doug's grades were good, so he qualified for the half-day program and found a busboy job at an upscale steakhouse. Unlike the way things are nowadays, in 1982, it was nearly impossible for a teenager to get a part-time job in a restaurant unless a friend or a relative could vouch for you. Doug relentlessly pursued that job at the Stables Steakhouse. For three months, he would show up every Monday between 3.30 and 4 p.m. He'd walk in the front door and ask to speak with Jim, the manager. Doug would say, Jim, I know you're tired of seeing me every Monday, but I need this job. One day, somebody's going to quit or get fired, and I want to make sure you give me a shot as a busboy. I'll never let you down. I'll show up on time. I'll work hard. The Stables Steakhouse was a four-mile walk from our house. At the time, Doug did not own a vehicle. In those days, we would skateboard everywhere we went. After three months of pestering the restaurant manager, Jim finally caved in and offered Doug a busboy job. He told my brother he didn't need another busboy, but his persistence paid off. Jim offered Doug four hours per night on the busiest nights of the week, Friday and Saturday. Doug accepted the job, and within a couple of weeks, Jim increased the number of hours in Doug's schedule because he had proven himself to be an excellent worker. In 1982, the minimum wage was $3.35 per hour, and almost every restaurant in our town paid teenagers the minimum wage. Stable's Steakhouse was known to be upscale and well-managed. I remember they made the staff wear pressed white shirts and khaki pants with solid black shoes. They boasted the best steaks in town. 
Getting a job as a busboy at the stables was a tremendous achievement for a teenager because they paid $6 per hour, well over the minimum wage. In 1982, for my brother and our family, that was huge. We were proud of Doug. Chapter 2. The Fix-It Shop Even though Doug was in high school and the pay was good as a stables busboy, he was still on the lookout for more work opportunities. He was ambitious and always seemed relentless in his search for odd jobs to earn extra money for the family. One day, while reading the classified ads in our local newspaper, Doug came across a listing for a new business called The Fix-It Shop. The Fix-It Shop was located in a previously abandoned and run-down old building. It was less than three miles from our house. We passed it every day on the school bus. I can still see it as clear as day in my mind, especially the two rather large signs posted in the storefront windows. One sign read, We Fix Anything. The other one, in large letters, advertised, We Buy Anything of Value. I remember the newspaper ad plainly stated the fix-it shop position was for a full-time driver. This didn't discourage Doug, despite his already busy schedule with school and the busboy job. In his mind, being a driver was the perfect job for him, with his newly acquired ugly green van. Like I said, he was ambitious and clever. Instead of calling the number listed in the ad, he decided to go straight to the business to speak directly with the owner. He believed he could convince the owner to hire him, just like he convinced the manager of the steakhouse to give him the unattainable busboy job. Doug figured if the owner checked out his new $300 van with the Bondo and faded green paint, he'd hire him on the spot. To my surprise, he was right. Doug had walked into the fix-it shop, and there stood the owner, Dave Jones. He was a six-foot-tall, dark-haired gentleman with tattoos on both arms and a look of wariness in his eyes. Doug introduced himself to Dave and proudly explained that he'd just bought his first vehicle and read the ad placed in the paper seeking a delivery driver. Doug gave his best sales pitch. He told Dave that if he hired him on a part-time basis after school, he would save the company money. Dave liked what he heard and explained the details of the job to Doug. The fix-it shop was similar to a pawn shop. People would bring in a wide variety of valuables they wanted to sell. Dave would evaluate these and offer the customer a purchase price. Unlike a pawn shop, he would only purchase the items, not pawn them. Dave's vast array of items accumulated quickly. The problem was that he didn't have enough space in his shop to store everything. Dave explained to Doug that he owned another building across town where he stored the extra inventory. So, Doug's job would be to load the items into his ugly green van, take them to the warehouse, and unload them there. Doug would be paid cash daily for hauling his stuff. With a handshake, Dave hired Doug, and they drove to the warehouse so Doug could see where to deliver the goods. On the way to the warehouse, Dave asked several questions about Doug's personal life. He wanted to know what made my brother tick what his home life was like, and the type of friends he hung around. Doug mentioned the hard times our family was going through and the constant struggle to pay the bills. He told him how our mother had been out of work because of being shot in the convenience store robbery. He explained Dad's inability to hold down a steady job owing to his back surgery and excessive drinking to cope with the pain. He told Dave that all these things were what drove him to work as much as possible, knowing his earnings would help to make ends meet. When they arrived at the warehouse, Doug noticed the door had a logging chain wrapped around a metal handle for extra security. It was a large metal building with steel bars over the windows to keep intruders out. Inside the building were rows of eight-foot-long portable tables that held all the items Dave purchased at the fix-it shop. Each item had a tag with a name on it, and next to that were a date and more numbers. Doug was amazed by how many tools were lying on the tables. Dave explained to Doug that he was expected to unload the items each day in a designated area away from the tables. 
Dave would then sort and tag the items himself. That was not part of my brother's job. Dave would also be the one to put all the items on the tables after he processed each one. Doug asked what he was going to do with all the things he was purchasing. Dave explained that he would eventually collect enough items to start an indoor flea market in that warehouse. Dave had arranged all the tables in neat rows. Customers would be able to walk freely through the warehouse, up and down each aisle, as they looked through all the items for sale. He said he could make good money with his indoor flea market because he had made such low-ball offers to his customers in the fix-it shop for their items. Dave asked Doug to spread the word around the neighborhood that he would pay cash for anything of value. He told Doug that no questions would be asked about where these items came from. He simply needed good quality items that he could resell for a profit. Doug felt a tinge of wariness when he saw several guns lying on the tables. It didn't exactly seem above board to my brother, especially the legality of the gun sales. But he needed the work and let it slide. Doug understood the key to the warehouse was not to be taken home. He was only allowed to take the key to and from the warehouse and to unlock and lock it back up after his deliveries. When he returned to the shop, he would give the key directly back to Dave. At that point, he would be paid cash for that particular delivery. Even though a few things didn't sit right with Doug, he thought his new delivery gig would be a great deal. His ugly green van got him to school and work, but it was such a gas guzzler that he couldn't afford to keep it filled. He loved his job at the steakhouse, but he only got a paycheck every two weeks, and most of that went to the family bills. His new boss was going to pay him cash every day after his delivery. He could keep his green guzzler running. I think Doug had been working at the shop for about four days when I decided to drop by after school. I figured I could give Doug a hand loading up his green grass hog. This is when Charles entered the story. He was Doug's best friend. They were both 16 years old and in the same grade. Charles was a quiet and somewhat reserved person. He was a likable guy, but didn't have many friends. Charles was always polite and eager to help if you needed a hand. Charles didn't have a car or a driver's license, so he rode the same school bus as I did. He lived about a half mile from the shop. On the bus ride home that day, I told Charles I wanted to get off at his bus stop and go to the shop to see if Doug needed any help. Charles asked if he could tag along, and I said, sure. If Doug didn't need our help, we would go to the little store located above the shop and play our favorite video game, Pac-Man. In 1982, Pac-Man was the hottest video game around. We spent many hours trying to break the high score. That game was addictive. In those days, if you were a male teenager... You were playing Pac-Man. For me and many of the guys I knew, it was our favorite hobby. My dad's brother, Uncle Bobby, owned just about every video game machine in town. He had hundreds of pool tables, arcade games, and jukeboxes spread from Middle Tennessee all the way up to Central Kentucky. Uncle Bobby owned an entertainment business with several employees and would employ my dad from time to time. He did it to help his brother when money was tight. Unfortunately, that was the case much too often, and my uncle would get frustrated with my dad and his excessive drinking. Charles and I knew the maintenance and collection schedule for the Pac-Man machine located in the same building as the fix-it shop. We knew if we were there playing Pac-Man when Uncle Bobby or one of his workers arrived to empty the coins, he would give us free credits on the game, and we could play for hours. Uncle Bobby liked us all. He would often pay us to come to his warehouse and clean the dust from the inside of the games that he had stored there. Dust was the number one threat to the video games. Each game had a computer board housed inside, and the components needed to stay as dust-free as possible, or it could overheat. It was tedious, time-consuming work, but it was a good way to earn money. It had to be done periodically to keep the games functioning properly. Inside each game was a coin bucket. Every time we opened a game to clean it, we would find coins in the bottom of the casing that had fallen out of the bucket. My uncle had a 55-gallon steel drum located in his warehouse, and if we found coins in the bottom of the machine, we would toss the coins in the steel drum. Over time, the drum had become so full of coins that my uncle considered getting a second drum. 
I have no idea how much money was in that drum, but it had to be over $10,000 in coins. My Uncle Bobby was wealthy. He didn't need the money, so he didn't care about the change in the drum. But he did care about loyalty and trust, and he made it clear to all of us that we were never to take coins from the barrel. We were tempted to take some to get a Coke out of the machine located outside the warehouse, but we never did. We all understood that the barrel of coins was off-limits to everyone, even us. We never took money from the barrel, not even on the days that we were dead broke and thirsty. The bus ride home seemed long. It was a chilly day, and the vinyl bus seats made it feel ten degrees colder. Spring in Tennessee can be unpredictable. The weather can change at a moment's notice. One minute it's warm and sunny, you're comfortable in a t-shirt. The next minute, a cold front comes out of nowhere, and you're wishing you had brought your warm jacket. Our bus driver was an older gentleman. We only knew him by his nickname, Shaky. He said he acquired it because of a medical condition that made his body twitch all the time. Shaky started driving our bus on the very first day of our school year. Doug, Charles, and I would always sit in the first seat behind him. That way we could listen to him tell stories about his younger days in the Army, his body twitching sporadically as he drove. One day, Doug got the nerve to ask him why he shook all the time. He said it started while he was in Vietnam, and it has stayed with him ever since. Shaky explained that he had no control over it. He kept a sense of humor about it, though. He often made funny jokes about his uncontrollable shaking and blamed his bad golf swing on his condition. He said his golf buddies are the ones who named him Shaky. From that day forward, we called him Shaky, too. He didn't mind that nickname. In fact, he had fun with it. We enjoyed getting to know him and listening to his funny stories every day on that bus to and from school. He always seemed to be in a good mood and he made us laugh. When the bus finally arrived at Charles's stop, we got off and started walking the half mile to the fix-it shop. It turned out to be perfect timing because Doug and his new boss were about to load up a riding lawnmower that Dave had bought that morning. Doug introduced Charles and me to his boss, and without hesitation, we offered to help them load the mower into the van. After that, we helped them load the rest of the items Dave had purchased that day. Charles and I then rode with Doug to the warehouse to help him unload everything. After that day, riding with Doug became a daily routine for Charles and me. We would get out of school, ride the bus to his stop, and then walk the half mile to the shop where we hung out with Dave and Doug, helping them load the van if needed. Dave was an interesting character. I never knew what to make of him. He was mysterious, never giving out too many details about his personal life. He wasn't especially talkative, either. He sure knew how to repair things, though. One of the riding mowers he purchased didn't have keys. He showed us how to bypass the electrical system and hotwire the mower so it could be started without the keys. We were fascinated by that little lesson. One day, while Charles and I were hanging out with Doug at the shop, Dave began to question us about drugs. To him, we probably looked a little bit rough around the edges in our hand-me-down jeans, worn-out T-shirts, and long hair. Even though we grew up in a rough neighborhood, none of us were into drugs. We didn't smoke pot. We didn't drink alcohol. We certainly didn't take pills. We knew people who did, though. At one point, Dave focused his inquiry on me and asked pointedly if I smoked weed. I replied simply and truthfully, no, sir. He then asked if I knew where he could buy some weed. Of course I did. Everybody in our neighborhood knew somebody who sold marijuana. To my surprise, he asked me if I'd be interested in buying some weed for him. That completely caught me off guard. I didn't object, though, because I liked being useful and didn't want to mess anything up for my brother. Dave said he would give me $10 to purchase a dime bag of pot. Once I brought the weed back to him, he would pay me $10 for doing it. What could I say? I was 15 and naive. It seemed like an easy way to make some money. In my mind, I wasn't doing anything wrong because I wasn't the one smoking the weed. I was merely helping my brother's boss score it. So that's exactly what I did. The next day, I bought some marijuana at school with the $10 Dave gave me. That afternoon, I got off the bus as usual and took the contraband to the fix-it shop. I handed it to Dave, 
who was good for his word, and paid me the ten dollars. It was at that moment that shame overcame me. I knew what I had done was wrong, but the deal was done. I couldn't undo it. The fix-it shop was located in a strip mall. It was a large block building that had a convenience store on the upper main level. On the lower level, there were three retail spaces available for rent. Next door to this building was a large house owned by Will Walters. Mr. Walters also owned the building with the convenience store and the fix-it shop. He would occasionally walk around the property and collect rent from the business owners. Everything changed after the second week of Doug's employment at the shop. We had just loaded the van and were standing near the counter just shooting the breeze with Dave when he abruptly ended the conversation. He seemed somewhat alarmed, announcing, Mr. Walters is about to come in, so I need you all to go wait in the back room while we discuss business. We didn't understand the gravity of the situation and hesitated. Dave showed an angry side to his personality that we had never witnessed. He raised his voice, glared his eyes, and shouted, Now! A large oval mirror was mounted outside the front door of the fix-it shop. It was aimed at the side of the building. It was used for surveillance, allowing Dave to see people coming toward the shop. He had spotted Mr. Walters in the mirror as he was approaching the store, resulting in us getting banished to the back room. We had no idea why Dave was so disturbed or so adamant about not wanting us to hear his conversation with Mr. Walters. Before that day, none of us had ever been in the back room, not even Doug. Dave had made it very clear to all of us that we were never allowed back there. So, confused, we hurried away to get out of sight from Mr. Walters. We exited the front room through a door that opened to a small hallway. As we walked down the hallway, I noticed a doorway to the left. It didn't have a door, it simply had a black curtain hanging on a rod. Doug and Charles kept walking toward the back, but out of curiosity, I decided to enter the room behind the black curtain. I wish I had never done so. I had no idea then how much I would regret that one small, yet life-changing decision. As I entered the room, I saw a video camera. It was set up and running with the lens pointed at a large window. This was no ordinary window. It was one-way glass. You could see out, but you couldn't see in because of the reflection on the glass. I was standing in the observation room. Looking out the window that this camera was aimed at, I clearly saw Dave and Mr. Walters having a conversation. It was a slightly strange feeling, knowing that they couldn't see me watching them. But it didn't alarm or disturb me. I rationalized that it made sense for Dave to have a camera for security purposes. After all, he buys valuables from people and always had wads of cash on hand. What if he was robbed? I figured this was probably Dave's backup if he ever had to prove the nature of any transaction to authorities. He would have it on record, so to speak. After their conversation, I witnessed Mr. Walters exit the store. Dave came rushing to the back room. He opened the curtain, saw me, and went ballistic. In a rage, he started yelling at me. What the hell do you think you're doing in here? He grabbed me and pushed me out of the curtained-off area. Doug and Charles came running to find out what was going on. Dave was out of control and raging with anger. He shouted at us to leave the premises immediately. Calming ever so slightly, he told Doug that he would call him later to let him know if he could use him anymore. As he spoke the words, I instantly felt guilty, realizing that I may have jeopardized my brother's job. But why? I had no idea how my being in that room for only a few short minutes could so drastically upset Dave, much less to the point that Doug could lose his job. The ride home in the van was not pleasant. You could cut the tension with a knife. I hoped it wouldn't take long to disappear, because Doug knew I didn't intentionally do anything wrong. The three of us were dumbfounded over what had just happened. We couldn't figure out why seeing that camera was such a big deal to Dave. Doug was clearly upset that his boss was mad, but he was more upset with me for going into the camera room.
I must have apologized thirty times. I think Doug was afraid he had disappointed Dave by allowing Charles and me to hang out with him during work. And, of course, he was worried that, as a result of us being there, especially me, he probably just lost a good job. If we had not been there, this thing with the surveillance camera never would have happened. Chapter 3. The ATV Thankfully, Doug received a call from Dave the very next day. He requested that Doug, Charles, and I come to the shop because he needed to talk with all of us. Dave said he had a load of items to deliver to the warehouse, and he wanted Charles and me to go along because some of the things were heavy and he'd need help. Doug got us all together, and we nervously headed to the shop. Before saying anything else, Dave immediately apologized to us for his rash behavior. He told us he had overreacted because the camera equipment was highly expensive and he didn't like anyone tampering with it. As he said he was sorry, I couldn't help but feel there was no sincerity in his forced words. I shrugged it off, though. I was happy to be back in Dave's good graces. I was so relieved that I hadn't caused Doug to lose his job. I told Dave I was sorry for going into the camera room and promised it wouldn't happen again. Problem resolved. Everything was back on track. With all three of us feeling a major sense of relief, we loaded the van with all the items Dave had designated for us to take to storage. We made the delivery to the warehouse and went directly back to the shop to return the key to Dave. That's when we were informed that he needed us to make one more run. We were to pick up a riding mower from a house only three miles from the shop. He said the mower had flat tires and needed repairing. It had a chain wrapped around it with a lock on it, he explained the owner of the mower had lost the key to the lock and needed us to cut the lock with bolt cutters, pick up the mower, and bring it back to the shop so he could repair it for the man. Dave gave Doug a set of bolt cutters with the words Fix-It Shop written in black letters across the handle. He then wrote down directions to the house. Dave said it was the White House on the corner of Oakmont and Cedar Drive. The house had an open carport, and the mower was under the carport. You could see it clearly from the road. We knew what house he was talking about because it was very close to the movie theater on a busy street. Dave said we didn't need to bother knocking on the door because the owner was not at home and that he already talked to him about picking his mower up. All we had to do was cut the lock, load the mower, and get it back to the shop so Dave could get it ready in time for the mowing season. We arrived at the house and saw the mower was right where Dave said, under the carport. It was also apparent that it was in need of repair. It was an old Alice Chalmers riding mower, with tires that were all dry-rotted and flat. The mower looked as though it had been sitting there for years, because it had about two inches of dust on it. The chain and lock were rusted. Despite Dave saying that he confirmed our pickup with the homeowner, Doug decided he should knock on the door anyway. He felt very uncomfortable taking the mower without letting the owner know we were there. Doug knocked several times. I reminded Doug that Dave said the man would not be home, so he cut the lock. We loaded the mower into the van and dropped it off at the shop. Dave was not at the shop when we returned. We decided to unload the mower in front of the shop because it was such a piece of junk that nobody would consider stealing it. We figured the mower wasn't worth $20 of scrap metal. Doug said he would give Dave's bolt cutters back to him the next day after school. We felt much better that evening, believing we had resolved the whole mess. I was off the hook. Doug's job was no longer in jeopardy. All was good. The next morning, Doug and I woke up and got ready for school. Like any other day, mornings were always chaotic with so many kids in one small house. Everyone was fighting for their fair share of personal time in the one bathroom. To save time and make mornings less of a struggle, I would typically shower every night before bed. Everybody has their quirks in life, and I admit I have more than a few myself. My biggest quirk is a daily shower. On the rare occasion I wasn't able to take a shower, typically in the dead of winter when our pipes froze, I would call my best friend Larry and run to his house. His family didn't mind, which was good because I had to have my all-important shower. Plus, it was 1982, and shoulder-length hair was the style for teenagers. 
So Doug and I let our hair grow long. We took pride in keeping it maintained. It must have been around 7 a.m. when the phone rang that morning. It was Dave. He told Doug he had made a deal with a guy to buy a Honda Odyssey ATV. He needed all three of us to pick it up. Doug explained it was a school day and that we wouldn't be able to do this run unless Dave could talk our mother into letting us go. He suggested that it might work if he asked our mom for permission to miss a day of school. We got mom on the phone, and she talked to Doug's boss. Dave told her about the deal he had made. He said he would pay us well to go pick the vehicle up and bring it to the shop. Dave apparently knew all the right words to say because Mom agreed to let us miss the day of school. For the life of us, we couldn't understand why Dave insisted that Charles needed to come with us. As I think back, red flags kept popping up with this fellow Dave. I instinctively sensed something was off, but being so young and eager to make money, I kept shrugging off any negative thoughts associated with Dave. With our permission to skip school granted, Doug phoned Charles. He told him about the job we were hired to do and explained that Dave insisted all three of us went. Charles said he would do it, but he didn't think his mom would allow him to skip school. Let's just not tell my mom, he said. We picked up Charles, just like we did every morning in Doug's van. Charles didn't breathe a word of our plan to his mom. For all she knew, it was just another ordinary day the three of us heading off to school. The first thing we had to do was meet Dave at the shop. He gave us the directions to where we were going, what we were picking up, and who we would be meeting. Dave gave Doug $150 cash and told us to meet a guy named Dick Johnson at a store about 30 miles away on the Tennessee-Kentucky border. Dave explained that we would be picking up a trailer that had a Honda Odyssey ATV on it. We were to haul it back to the warehouse, but first, we had to stop at the co-op to get a two-inch towing ball. Doug had occasionally used Dave's trailer when hauling larger items, so Dave knew the towing ball on the green gas guzzler wouldn't fit the trailer we had to pick up. Dave also told Doug to fill the tank with gas and to charge the tow ball and the gas to his co-op account. He said if we had any problems, we were to tell Roger to call him. Roger was the manager of the co-op. So, our first stop on this ill-fated journey was at our local co-op. We filled up the tank with gas and bought a two-inch ball for the hitch, just as instructed. We didn't realize until after we made our purchase that we didn't have any tools with us. We hadn't previously had any significant need for carrying tools on our deliveries. We asked Roger if he could loan us a wrench. Roger borrowed a wrench from one of his mechanics and we installed the tow ball ourselves. Doug returned the tool and thanked the co-op worker. Doug then asked Roger if he could get a receipt for the gas and tow ball. While he was writing out the receipt, he remembered that Dave was in the store a couple of days earlier and bought some bolt cutters, but forgot his receipt on the counter. Roger still had that receipt and asked if we would give it to Dave when we saw him. Doug said it was no problem, took both receipts, and we were on our way. It seemed kind of cool, the idea of the three of us being on this away-from-school adventure. We felt like everything was going our way. Chapter 4 The Arrest Oh, how things can change in the blink of an eye. Life was pretty good for the three of us that morning. We were skipping a day of school, with permission, and chugging down cold, mellow yellows while heading north in Doug's ugly green gas guzzler. So far, our mission to pick up an oversized go-kart for Doug's boss was going smoothly. Our euphoria wouldn't last. We reached our pickup point, a convenience store just past the Kentucky border, ahead of schedule. Doug and I were quite familiar with this store. We passed it on the way to the tobacco fields we worked every summer. I knew this store had a Pac-Man machine, but... None of us had ever been there long enough to play it. Thankfully, we had time to spare that day, so we finally got to play the machine. The posted high score was one I knew I could beat. I'd done it so many times before. We were in the state of Kentucky, so the thought of claiming the high score in a state other than Tennessee was exceptionally enticing. 
I was determined to beat the high score so I could put my own initials in the top space, claiming victory and feeling like the state champion. I was stoked. I was killing Doug and Charles at Pac-Man while we waited for Dick Johnson to show up with his oversized go-kart. To say we didn't mind that he showed up an hour late would be an understatement. We were ditching school and having a great time playing our favorite electronic game. More importantly, I beat that top score and proudly typed my title-holding initials into the top slot. I was now king in Kentucky. The guy finally arrived and came into the store. We spotted him instantly. There was a military bearing to the man with a close-cropped burr haircut, steely eyes, leathery skin, and muscular physique. He approached us and introduced himself. You must be the three young fellows Dave Jones sent to pick up that Honda out there. My name's Dick. He put out his hand to shake, and we all returned the greeting. Johnson continued, If you boys are ready, I'll show you the ATV. It's outside, attached to my truck. We could have played that Pac-Man game forever, but we had accomplished our mission of beating the top scores. Now it was time to complete our real assignment. We headed outside with this fellow, Dick, to check out the Honda. After looking it over, we thought, Holy crap, Dave got a deal! That thing was sweet. Doug paid Mr. Johnson the $150, and we took possession of the ATV. I must admit, we were dying to ride that thing. After Dick had left, Charles and I persuaded Doug to let us take the ATV off the trailer. We took turns riding it around for about five minutes each in the field next to the store. We were having a blast. Boy, this oversized go-kart had power. We were on cloud nine that day. No school nearly two hours of dominating Pac-Man, and riding the kick-ass ATV. We were actually going to get paid for all this fun. It doesn't get much better than that. We secured the ATV back onto the trailer, and Doug made a call from a payphone to Dave back at the fix-it shop. In 1982, there were no cell phones. He told his boss that Dick Johnson had shown up as planned, and the ATV looked and ran great. We were about to head back to Clarksdale to bring it to him. Dave told Doug to take the ATV to the warehouse. He also gave Doug specific instructions on the route he needed to follow. Doug said he knew a shorter way that he'd rather take, but Dave insisted that we follow his instructions and take the specified route. It's crucial that you do not veer off that path, Dave adamantly expressed. He rationalized that we were not to take the shortcut because those roads were narrow with sharp turns, and he didn't want to risk having an accident while pulling the heavy trailer. During the entire drive back to the warehouse, all we talked about was that ATV. Even though we only had a short time riding it around that field, it was enough. We were hooked. We wanted it. We then wondered if Dave would sell it to us. As Dave had only paid $150 for it, we figured he would probably be happy to let us pay him $300 for it. That would double his money. There was only one problem with this new idea. We didn't have $300. The conversation in that green van quickly turned to how we could solve that problem. One of us thought we could probably ask our Uncle Bobby to loan us the money. We'd be more than happy to trade it out by working for him. We were driving, as instructed, on the route that Dave insisted we took. It was an uneventful drive for the most part. We spent that time putting together a solid game plan to make that ATV ours. It wasn't until we were within three miles of the warehouse when I noticed three police cars idling at the upcoming intersection. The traffic light was green as we approached to make our left turn. Doug had his left turn signal on. The traffic light then switched from green to yellow right as we got there. Doug couldn't possibly stop the van fast enough especially with the heavy trailer and the ATV in tow. The weight of the load was a concern, but to stop so suddenly could wreak havoc upon the trailer hitch. The ATV itself could also come loose. Doug had no choice but to drive right on through the yellow light. Charles and I immediately started teasing him. Laughing, we told him he ran that light and those cops were going to give him a ticket. Doug answered back, No way! That light was clearly yellow! I didn't run a red light. We all knew that was the truth, but just as we made the left turn and straightened out, 
all three of those idling police cars came alive. The cops turned on their sirens and flashing lights, then pulled us over. Charles and I were laughing at Doug. We thought this was funny that our prediction came true and the cops did come after him. But surely it couldn't be anything much, could it? I mean, we hadn't done anything wrong. Doug stopped, and we were all puzzled. Why all three police cars? All three policemen approached us from both sides of the van. They acted like something serious was transpiring. A stern, aggressive-acting cop, I thought at the time, demanded, with no warmth or courtesy, that Doug exit the van. Upon doing so, the cold law officer marched him to the rear of the vehicle. The one who had come over to the passenger side remained at that window that I'd rolled down. Sit tight, you two, he ordered Charles and me, with the same stern manner and mean disposition. The third officer joined the conversation with Doug. They interrogated my brother, asking a few questions about the ATV, where had it come from, what was he doing with it, that sort of thing. Doug explained that his boss bought it, and his job was to pick it up and deliver it back to his warehouse. The officer informed Doug that the ATV was reported stolen, and he was under arrest for grand larceny. From inside the van, Charles and I were watching the proceedings. We couldn't hear what they were saying, but we could tell what was going on by the mood and actions of my brother and the tough cop. The expression on Doug's face when he was arrested looked like he went instantaneously into a state of shock. Charles, something is terribly wrong here, I muttered softly to my buddy. They're handcuffing Doug and walking him to the police car. The officer at my window commanded Charles and me to get out of the vehicle and put our hands on the van so they could search us. They informed us that we were also under arrest for grand larceny. They proceeded to read us our rights and began to search the van. One of the officers pulled out the bolt cutters that belonged to Dave. As this was going down, Charles and I tried to explain to the cop that the bolt cutters belonged to Doug's boss. If they would contact Dave at the fix-it shop, he could clear all this up. I made the mistake of taking my hands off the van and turned around to speak to the officer. For that terrible transgression, the policeman slammed me hard against the van and shoved his elbow into the back of my head. He started shouting aggressively at me to spread my legs further so he could search me. It was a nightmare in broad daylight, fully awake. I couldn't comprehend what was happening, or more so, why it was happening. All I knew was this officer was not listening to me, and he was getting more and more aggressive for no reason. He kept yelling at me to spread my legs further. I couldn't stand it anymore. This was police brutality and unnecessary. I hadn't done anything wrong. I snapped back at the bully. Go fuck yourself. I realized that was about the worst thing I could tell a cop. But I was at my limit. Mr. Policeman responded by abruptly kicking my feet out from under me. He picked me up off the ground and slammed me into the van again, this time twice as hard as before. He continued to yell at me, this time something about me being a no-good punk kid, while he handcuffed me. He walked me back to his police car, shoving me each step of the way. What a complete jerk! Before this ordeal... I had tremendous respect for adults and authority figures, such as police officers. In school, I made friends easily and never started trouble, never picked a fight. But I have to admit, I never had patience for anyone who showed disrespect or bullied others. When cornered, I would come out fighting with no hesitation. I feared nobody, not even the police. I know I should have done the right thing and simply let the officer arrest me. I should have just stayed silent. But come on, that cop was entirely out of line, and in that moment I was frustrated, confused, and desperate. There was nothing appropriate about the way that pushy officer treated me. It was with intentional and excessive unreasonable force. His conduct was entirely unsuitable for an upstanding authority figure. He was threatening my life for no reason. I immediately lost all respect for him as a man, and especially as a policeman. He had become my opponent, and I snapped. 
There was no way I could understand what was unfolding on that awful day. We were innocent, and that's all I knew. Doug's boss could have cleared it all up with one phone call. Yet, none of the cops would listen to us. We were three helpless juveniles, clueless that things were only going to get worse. A lot worse. Chapter 5. The Police Station There we were, handcuffed and sitting in the back seat of a police car heading to jail. How could this have happened? An hour earlier, I was drinking a mellow yellow and approaching the high score on Pac-Man. I was 15 years old and just got arrested for grand larceny. It didn't make sense. I wasn't a criminal. I've never stolen anything. I just couldn't understand how this huge mistake could have happened. Doug, Charles, and I thought that once we got to the police station, Doug would call the fix-it shop. Dave would come to the jail and resolve the erroneous situation. Dave would fix this mess. We all knew Charles would be in a lot of trouble when his parents found out that he had skipped school and had wound up in this mess. So many things were running through our minds, but not for a second did we think we were guilty of grand larceny. Since we were all granted one call at the police station, Doug used the phone first and dialed Dave at the shop. He got no response. It was my turn, so I called our mom. I explained to her how the Honda Dave had us pick up earlier today was a stolen ATV. I told my mother we could discuss it later, but right now we needed her to get us out of jail. Once I hung up, Charles used his one call to dial his mother. Doug and I could hear his conversation. It was not going well. He said he would explain everything later, but asked her to please get him out of jail. It didn't take long for Charles's mom and dad to arrive. Soon after, my parents also showed up at the county jail. The officers informed our parents we were under arrest for grand larceny. They processed and booked us into a jail cell. Our parents explained to the officer that we were minors. They understood that in the state of Tennessee, you could not hold juveniles if the parents come to sign their child out. The police didn't care. They didn't budge. I felt like they had it in for us. But why? We were detained until further notice. It would be up to the judge to decide when we would be released. None of us had ever been to jail. We hadn't been in any law-breaking trouble before. The police took us through a maze of hallways until we finally reached our cell, located in the basement. That's where they threw us, in the basement. It was a large room with a concrete floor roughly 30 feet long by 20 feet wide. There were four smaller cells within, each equipped with a bunk bed and toilet. A steel picnic table sat near the front of the chamber. A single stand-up shower ran along the back wall, opposite the steel entry door. At night, they would make each of us get into a small cell. They locked the gates to each one to isolate us from each other. Every morning they would open the small cell gates, so once again everyone within could mingle and circulate in the large main room. When we first arrived, the three of us were the only ones in the juvenile cell. That soon changed. The authorities were taking forever to do anything about letting us out. It felt like we were rotting away in that dark jail cell while everyone we knew was enjoying the freedom of the bright, sunshiny world. Our parents were trying their best to seek help in our release. Apparently, nobody within the court system would listen to their pleas. They were given little information about what was going on or why we were being held so indiscriminately. The only thing we learned was that a court date for our hearing was set. We would be here at least eight days. Even at my young age, I knew that couldn't be legal. We had to endure eight full days in jail before we could speak with the judge and get bail set. Are you kidding me? An enormous question entered my mind, took hold, and wouldn't let go. What was going on? We were assigned a cell for juveniles. If you've never been inside a jail cell, trust me when I tell you to avoid that experience at any cost. It strips a person of all freedom and dignity. I'll never forget how horrible it was being detained in that cell. The taste, the sounds, the smell, 
It's all indelibly stamped into my soul. We were trapped like animals in a zoo. Our cell was windowless. We had no sunlight. It was always dark and cold. The food was terrible. Our meals consisted of peanut butter sandwiches made from stale bread and crappy peanut butter, served with what we figured was watered-down Kool-Aid. The cell had a strange odor, like a mixture of Lysol and generic soap. It was stale and sour. If there was a cleaning crew, we never saw them, and they obviously weren't concerned about being thorough. The paint on the bars was green and chipped, industrial-looking. The bunks were hard, cold steel. They gave each prisoner a mattress and a blanket. The mattress was made of vinyl that was, at best, two inches thick. It felt cold and clammy, like those damn school bus seats I hated. The blanket was very itchy wool. It was worn thin and too small to do much good. Everything echoed in that jail. It was such a hollow environment, made of concrete and steel with no fabric to absorb the noise. There was always a lot of noise. It seemed like one constant, annoying clamor of metal doors shutting and locking. Mixed in were the angry shouts from people in the other cells. The yelling kept up throughout the day and into the night. On the wall at the entrance to the cell were four thick plexiglass windows. They were approximately three feet tall and one foot wide. There was a vent hole cut in the center, so if you had a visitor, you could speak through the hole. The lighting was terrible, the bulbs were fluorescent, and flickered. It seemed at any moment the bulbs would blow. Jail is no place for anyone who is even remotely claustrophobic. I had a bad case of that affliction. When you are locked in a tiny cell, you have time to think, time to panic. What would happen if a fire broke out in the building? What could I do to save myself? Nothing. Would they have enough time to get us out? Would they even try to save us? We were down there in the bowels of the building, in the basement. What if the plumbing backed up and the place flooded? How would we get out of there? Does it sound like I was paranoid? You got that right. I was overwhelmed with fear and worry. My mind was racing with negative thoughts. It had taken the whole first day and night before I began to calm down. Of course, we didn't get much sleep that night. The change in our routine was more drastic than anything I'd felt before or experienced since. They isolated us in those small cells and locked the rolling doors made of steel bars. Chunk. What a terrible realization. We were locked in, and there was nothing we could do about it. We couldn't see each other because a block wall separated the cells, but we could speak to each other by raising our voices a bit and aiming our voices outward. We stayed up half the night trying to sort out what had happened. We didn't resolve anything. We still couldn't figure out why any of this happened. We were pulled over and ambushed. Those cops were waiting specifically for us. It had to be a setup. Of course it was. But why? More importantly, what was going to happen to us? How were we going to get out of this mess? None of us got much sleep that first night. The next morning we were awakened by the sounds of slamming doors and inmates yelling. All I could think about was getting a towel so I could take a shower. Out of all the problems I was facing, the only thing I could concentrate on was my precious daily shower. It was the only thing giving me hope. In my mind, if I could get my shower out of the way, I could think more clearly and feel less perturbed. Maybe then I could figure out how we were going to get out of this jail. None of us thought we would spend an entire day in confinement. We thought our parents would speak with the judge or maybe an attorney and we would be set free. What we expected was for Dave to show up, explain everything, and put us in the clear. They would have to let us go. After all, we were minors. But guess what? None of these things happened that day. There was no reprieve. We were there to stay. Chapter 6. The ACLU A couple more days passed, and we still had no indication that they were going to let us out of jail anytime soon. 
While Charles, Doug, and I were involuntarily getting familiar with our stinky, lousy cells, our parents were busy trying to find answers to solve this mess. One of the first calls they made was to my oldest brother, Ron. Ron worked as a drill sergeant in Fort Benning, Georgia. He was an E-6 staff sergeant in the Army and had just received a promotion and a new assignment to the White House Honor Guard. The Honor Guard is a unit assigned to execute joint ceremonial events for the President of the United States. Ron was 10 years older than me and was both bright and wise. He was honest to the core. Ron excelled in everything he set his mind to. He graduated high school a year early, and at 17 years old, he chose to join the Army. One of his first major assignments was as a drill sergeant in Fort Benning. After his exemplary service, he was promoted to rank and assigned to the Honor Guard. Then he was reassigned as a crew member on the AWACS plane. The AWAC is an airborne early warning and control aircraft, commonly referred to by many as a spy plane. A few years later, he was transferred to the Pentagon to work for the Inspector General. Without a real understanding of how bad our situation was, Mom explained to Ron, as best as she could, all the events that led to our arrest. She reiterated everything we had told her about what happened at the intersection and what the police claimed we did. None of it made sense to Ron, either. It was unheard of to confine juveniles without bail and delay the court date. Each passing day, as we sat incarcerated in jail waiting for our court date, our parents tried finding answers to why this nightmare was happening. My mom and dad went to the fix-it shop and confronted Dave Jones. Dave just shrugged his shoulders and replied, It's out of my control. Then he turned on them, threatening to call the police and have them arrested if they didn't leave his property. The situation was completely out of control. No one was in any hurry to help us seek justice. One bizarre event led right to another. It all reeked of corruption. Our parents were hitting one brick wall after another, so our brother Ron got busy. He wasted no time making phone calls to authorities and law enforcement and government. He sought legal advice. With our rights violated, he contacted the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU man asked if we had an attorney, and Ron informed them that our parents could not afford an attorney. Under normal circumstances, the court was required to appoint us legal counsel, but so far, they had done nothing of the sort. For our first three days in jail, we were not allowed any visitation whatsoever. The lawyer Ron spoke with at the ACLU was disgusted and angry because U.S. citizens' rights were being abused and disregarded. At that point, they became involved. The ACLU did not have tolerance for officials who violated others' fundamental constitutional rights. At last, something was being done on our behalf, thanks to Ron. After the local police had received a few calls from Ron and the ACLU representatives, we were finally assigned a court-appointed attorney. But, unfortunately, that was another bizarre event. He was a complete joke. Our newly appointed lawyer was a hack. The first time he came to the jail to meet the three of us, it was evident that he had no interest in hearing our side of the story. That fat, sloppily dressed curmudgeon kept pressing us to plead guilty to the charges against us. He explained how he would then try to get us off on probation with no more jail time. This would guarantee our release so we could get on with our lives. All three of us were stunned. This guy was such a prick. As much as we wanted to get out of that miserable jail cell, we were not about to be lured into a plea deal for the bogus charges against us. In the meantime, he informed us that our court date was coming up, and he would request that the judge let us out on bond so we could go home. We would wait eight days to receive that hearing. At last, we would be heard. We would get our chance to tell the judge our side of the story. Optimistically, we believed the judge would listen to us, understand what a huge mistake this was, and finally put an end to this nightmare. Once and for all, we could go home and put this behind us. For the first time, I was looking forward to going back to school and riding that darn bus again. Were we sadly mistaken? We would soon find out that we were up against a tight, good old boy system run by the kind of men who worked within the law, making up the rules as they so deemed.
Chapter 7. The Violent Inmate For the first three days in jail, we were by ourselves with no other prisoners. On the fourth day, we were joined by a kid we knew from our school. He was arrested for violently beating his mother with a hammer. Tim was an intimidating black guy, standing at six foot three and 240 pounds. He was a senior in high school and was known by everyone to have a violent temper. Most considered him a ruthless bully. He wasn't afraid of anyone, and he made that very clear. He strutted into our cell block with his typical cocky attitude, proclaiming, What I say goes! As if things couldn't get worse, now we had to put up with this detestable creature sharing our cramped quarters. Charles had a reserved demeanor and was timid in the company of others. He did not like any form of confrontation. My brother Doug was always the reasonable and rational one of the group. Although Doug was not a fighter by nature, he would defend himself. I, on the other hand, was a stubborn Taurus. I was fearless and had no problem with being confrontational if need be. By fifteen, I had grown into a six-foot-tall, 170-pound young man. I was made of pure twisted steel, or so I felt. I had plenty of pent-up energy back then. Tim and I were immediately at odds. He was such a jerk at school, but in that small jail cell, his attitude was insufferable. The tension between us got heated right away. We were like ticking time bombs waiting to explode. To our amazement, he kept bragging about how he beat his mother with that hammer. Wow! How could anyone be proud of that? I couldn't believe what a low-life jackass he was. He continued to boast about his ruthless attack on his mother, giving us more details than we cared to know. I couldn't quite figure out if his blathering was part of an intimidation tactic or he really was that sadistic. Apparently, the more she begged him to stop beating her, the harder he'd hit her. This guy was a deranged prick. He then bragged about how he hated his mother's dog, so he beat it to death with the very same hammer. The assault on his mother started because she tried to intervene to save her dog. It was so hard to believe people as rotten and malicious as Tim existed. It was bad enough we were stuck in that jail cell, but when they threw that lunatic in with us, things became beyond miserable. The more he blathered and boasted, the quicker I lost my patience with him. Tim needed to be put in his place. Somebody needed to give him a taste of his own medicine. My whole life, I had been an animal lover. We often took in stray animals. Our home probably resembled a zoo to the neighbors because we always had rescued animals in our yard. I might not cross the street to help most humans, but I was such an animal lover that I would risk my life to rescue a dog. Tim's bragging about how he'd beaten that poor dog with a hammer made my blood boil. It was too much to tolerate, and I wasn't going to hear any more of it. I was already extremely tense from everything that happened over the past few days. I was going stir-crazy, knowing we would be trapped in that jail cell for at least four more days until our hearing. Life had taken its toll on me, but Tim pushed me over the edge. I snapped. I wanted revenge for that poor, defenseless dog. I was ready, willing, and able to take my rage out on that son of a bitch. All of us were sitting at the steel picnic table. Tim was sitting directly across from me. I hit my limit and shot straight up, backed over to the center of the floor, and in a rage said, You must feel like a badass motherfucker to be able to beat a helpless dog to death. I had blood in my eyes and venom in my veins. I pointed straight at the monster. How about you come over here and show me just how bad you are, you sick motherfucker? Without hesitation, Tim jumped up and came at me. Doug and Charles stood between us and struggled to keep us apart. The room had turned to bedlam. The jail cell area had a camera mounted high on the wall behind plexiglass, monitored by the guards in another room. It didn't take long before a guard came in and separated us. We were immediately locked back up, isolated in our small cells. This wasn't over, as far as I was concerned. The rage inside me lingered into the night. I couldn't stop thinking about that poor dog. I began obsessing about getting my hands on Tim. I wanted to inflict as much damage to him as fast as I could before he had a chance to retaliate. 
Tim spent the next few hours cursing me from his cell, letting me know, Your ass is grass, white boy. He was trying to intimidate me. He was making it quite clear that when he got the opportunity, he intended to hurt me. I knew he meant it. The guy was a sick psycho. He thought he was big and bad. In truth, he was all that. But I never feared him. That night, I visualized a fight with him, acting out the moves in my mind over and over. The next morning, I was going to put my plan into action. I knew in my heart that I was going to beat him like he beat that poor dog. Morning couldn't come soon enough. Chapter 8 The Fight is On The next morning, everything was silent when we woke. The guards opened all the small cells. As usual, we were served our crappy breakfast through a small rectangular trap door located in the middle of the large entry door. Tim started mumbling tough guy garbage about how he hadn't forgotten about yesterday. I sternly answered back that neither had I. I found the opening, the chance I was looking for, when Tim said he was going to take a shower. He went into his small cell to use the bathroom and get his towel. While he was out of sight, I told Charles and Doug about my plan and that I needed their help. I wanted Charles to climb on top of the picnic table when Tim got out of the shower. He was to hold his shirt in front of the camera to block the guards from seeing into our cell. At that point, I intended to unleash my fury and start beating Tim's ass. Charles said, You're crazy, man! That guy is twice your size! Hush, Charles! I whispered and motioned with my hands. Keep it down, man! We don't want him to hear us. But Charles was still concerned. In a much quieter, near whisper, he continued, If he gets his hands on you... We might not be able to get him off you. Don't worry, I said with confidence. Anybody that would beat a dog is a coward. He's all mouth, I'm sure of it, and I'll be damned if he doesn't need somebody to shut it. Yes, I was still raging, thinking about that poor dog. Tim got in the shower stall and pulled the curtain. Once inside, he undressed and threw all his clothes outside the curtain onto the concrete floor. He started singing in the shower, clueless of my presence, as I walked over and picked up his clothes. I took them to the entry door and threw them all, piece by piece, out the little opening into the hallway. Doug and Charles were grinning. We had been locked up for over four days with no entertainment, and I was about to put on a show. They knew things were about to get much more entertaining. Suddenly, we heard the water being turned off. We could hear Tim taking the towel he had hanging inside the shower to dry himself off. He opened the shower curtain and stepped onto the concrete floor. With a look of surprise, mixed with his usual anger, he wondered where his clothes had gone. He glared straight at me and said, Very funny, motherfucker. Where are my clothes? I said, Your clothes are in the hallway, asshole. You have a problem with that? Oh, man. I couldn't wait to teach this creep a lesson. I can't say exactly why, but I was dead certain that I could take him down. Now was my chance. I turned my head to Charles and said, Cover that camera, because his ass is mine. At this point, we were about 20 feet apart from each other. Without any hesitation, we met in the middle of the room. It was as if we were two prize fighters about to do battle. Tim was tall and outweighed me by at least 70 pounds, but I was lean and lightning fast with my hands and feet. I'd spent some time in our city boxing league, so I had training as a boxer. As soon as we were within striking distance, I unleashed a flurry of punches. All Tim could do was try to protect his face and body from the blows. I must have unloaded no less than 15 blows in quick succession. I moved in relentlessly and got him pinned against the concrete wall. I managed to reduce his six-foot-three body to a crouching, five-foot, whimpering coward. He was trying to protect himself from the rain of punches that I kept bringing down upon him. He never landed a single blow. As he sought to stand up, I kicked the backside of his left knee, and he fell like an oak tree in the woods. I refused to let up on him. I was so pissed off at this guy. I just couldn't stop myself. As I continued the flurry of punches, I kept yelling at him, "'How's this feel, asshole? Boom!' Is this what your dog felt? Whack! Is this what your mom felt, you fucking coward? Pound! Thud! Crack! 
Doug and Charles started yelling. They thought I had gone completely out of control. Maybe I had, but this person deserved everything I was dealing out. The guards are coming! The guards are coming! They shouted out to me. Sure enough, the main entry door opened, and guards came charging in to pull me off Tim. They marched us all into isolation again. As I slowly calmed down in my small cell, I didn't say anything. Tim, however, started to run his mouth from his cell again. It didn't matter to me anymore. With my job done, it was time to calm down and gather my thoughts. Regardless of how much tough talk the sick bastard spewed out, I knew Tim understood from that moment on. I was not someone he could bully. I gave him the message loud and clear that he was not as tough as he thought he was. Chapter 9 The Judge Hearing day had finally arrived. Our spirits were lifted. We were hopeful that our incarceration was about to come to an end. We believed that we were finally going to be allowed to go home to our families. That morning, the guards rounded us up, the three hardened teenage criminals. We were escorted into the courtroom. As we entered through the large wooden doors, I noticed there weren't many people in attendance. Apparently, the only people allowed in the courtroom were the attorneys, the families of the accused, and a handful of character witnesses who were there to speak on our behalf. The judge assigned to our case was Karen Caggiano. We knew Miss Caggiano from our neighborhood. At one time, she owned a small house next door to my best friend's house. She was just beginning her career when she lived there, but moved to a much larger home in a more desirable neighborhood just four years before this series of events transpired. She never liked any of us. Unfortunately, she had pretty good reasons for that. One day, my brothers Doug, Davy, and I were playing baseball on the street in front of her house. She interrupted our game and insisted that we could not play ball there on the street. She told us to find somewhere else to play, or she would call the police and get us forcibly removed. As she walked back inside her house, we proceeded to ignore her instructions. We continued to play because we were almost finished with the game anyway. I threw a fast pitch, and my brother Davy hit a nice line drive. As fate would have it, the speeding baseball struck the light pole in her yard and shattered the glass into the bulb. Miss Cajano was probably still keeping an eye on us from her living room when she heard the loud noise. She immediately came running back out, screaming at us. We realized then that we had pushed things to the limit. We were in the wrong, but we sure as heck weren't going to stick around. We scattered like sewer rats. Miss Caggiano was not about to let us get away that easily, though. In her mind, the whole lot of us were nothing but ill-mannered delinquents. She stormed right over to our house and knocked rapidly and very firmly on the front door. My mom, completely unaware of our unfortunate mishap, greeted her politely. Miss Caggiano, in a tone of obvious annoyance, explained to our mother how we blatantly disregarded her request to stop playing baseball near her yard. She insisted that we would have to pay for the damages we caused to her light fixture. Mom wasn't on our side on this one. She understood why Miss Caggiano was so bothered. Subsequently, we all had to chip in our precious, hard-earned money to replace that darn light. Ever since that day, it was clear that Miss Caggiano didn't care for us or for our family. She was rude and harsh. She was now our judge, and we knew that wouldn't be good for us. The street ball incident wasn't the only time we ran afoul of Karen Caggiano. The next time I met her was far worse. The street she lived on was only a block over from our address, but her house was quite some distance down that road, on a steep hill. My best friend, Larry, lived next door to her on the downside of the hill, slightly below the level of hers. Chapter 10. The Bionic Man Larry had a silver, round, metal stopwatch. He was fond of that watch in that particular way that young boys get infatuated with for any new toy or object. We were all convinced that his stopwatch was one of the coolest things a guy could have. He especially liked to test me on how fast I could run from my house to his. Larry would phone my house, and as soon as he said, Ready, set, go, I would hang up and take off running as quickly as possible, darting through the yards between our houses. My street was flat and level. 
Larry lived a street over, about a half mile away. After making the turn onto Larry Street, I would have to run through five different yards. Each of these yards had a block retaining wall about five feet tall that I had to hurdle. Even though they were tall and I was only eight years old, it wasn't that hard to jump over them because I was running full speed downhill. Whenever he called and set that stopwatch, I would shoot out my front door like an Olympic track star. I was determined to beat my latest personal best record each time. I would consistently execute that half mile in about three minutes. When I managed to break that barrier and clock in at two minutes, 58 seconds, it was a pretty big deal. In the 1970s, we all watched a popular TV show called The Six Million Dollar Man. The lead character, the show's namesake, had bionic arms and legs devised by modern science and technology. The high-tech robotic limbs replaced the crippled limbs he'd lost in an accident. As a result, he could run exceptionally fast, lift unimaginable weight, and accomplish any feats of strength better than ordinary human beings. I would pretend that I was the bionic man. So one day, I decided to pull a joke on Larry. Halfway between his house and mine lived our mutual friend, Mike. My plan was to phone Larry from Mike's house and tell Larry I was calling him from my house. With Mike's house being only half the distance to Larry's as mine, I knew I could shatter my previous record of three minutes. I expected to get the time down to something like a minute and a half. Larry would be blown away, and I might be able to convince him that I was bionic. I called Mike to get him in on my plan. He loved the idea and thought it would be hilarious to mess with Larry like that. Mike said, come on over. I could use his phone. I walked over to Mike's house, chuckling and smirking the whole way. Mike let me in, and we both died laughing. This prank was going to be hilarious. But first, we had to get over our giggles so I could make the call to Larry. Putting on a straight face, I dialed Larry's number and told him that I had been in an accident that crushed my legs. I said that they had put bionic legs on me at the hospital. Of course, Larry didn't believe me. No way they'd give an eight-year-old bionic legs, would they? Larry was only six years old then. He wasn't that wise. He said he didn't believe me. I needed to prove it to him. I gave Mike a conspiratorial smile. Do you have your stopwatch ready? Larry replied, it's in my hand. Okay, I'll show you. I had to cut my hand over the phone for a couple of seconds to hide the small bursts of laughter from Mike and me. Just give me the go and start your watch. Larry responded, Okay, ready, set, go! I hung up the phone and bolted out of Mike's house as fast as I could. From there, I was only five houses away. I was about to shatter my earlier record time. My prank to convince Larry that I indeed did have bionic legs was about to come to fruition. As I ran through the yards and jumped the retaining walls like hurdles, I approached Miss Caggiano's house. I sprung over the retaining wall around her property and immediately saw a large plate glass window leaning up against that wall. I didn't know it was there, under me, until it was too late. There was nothing I could have done to avoid crashing smack down in the middle of that humongous piece of glass. Her brand new window was now shattered into a million pieces, all thanks to me. Miss Caggiano was having replacement windows installed in her house. This particular piece of glass was huge. It was around six feet tall and six feet wide and undoubtedly expensive. It was to be the new living room picture window in front of the house. When I landed on top of that glass, breaking it into smithereens, I didn't stop running. I never fell, and amazingly, I didn't get a single cut or scratch. The workers witnessed my stupendous glass-shattering feat and began shouting at me, but I hightailed it out of there as fast as my bionic legs could take me. When I got to Larry's house, he immediately hit the stopwatch button. His eyes were as big as silver dollars. I had defeated my fastest run by about half the time. I was out of breath and more than a little panicked. I told Larry about my unexpected glass-shattering hurdle into Miss Caggiano's yard. He thought it was hysterical. I'm sure I would have thought the same had he been the one to annihilate that expensive window instead of me. Miss Caggiano already considered me a delinquent from the light post fiasco. This incident would only corroborate that once she found out it was me. When Larry stopped laughing, he told me he wanted to see what had happened. He talked me into going back 
to the scene of the crime. We snuck up to the hedgerow that bordered Miss Caggiano's driveway. The window replacement workers were busy picking up the broken shards of glass strewn across the lawn. Larry had seen all he needed to convince him right then and there that I was indeed bionic. He looked at my legs in awe. There wasn't a scratch on me from the broken glass. In utter amazement, he told me, there's no way you could run that fast and shatter that huge glass window unless you really were bionic. Wow! Larry couldn't believe there was such a thing as bionic. We were just eight- and six-year-old kids, though. Fooling my little buddy wasn't that difficult. I finally gave in and broke the news that I was just pulling his chain. We both got a good laugh about the joke I had just pulled off, but my laughter quickly faded into worry. Breaking Miss Caggiano's glass was bothering me. I knew I had done something wrong. I needed to talk to Larry's dad and let him know what happened. We called Larry's father Big Larry, as he had the same name as his son. Big Larry was more than my best friend's dad to me. He was a role model. He was always a sympathetic listener when you had a problem. He taught me, and I'm sure his own children, to face my problems and not run from my mistakes. Big Larry was a lineman at the electric department. He was the kind of dad most kids dreamed of having. He always took the time to make you feel special. He always made me feel like I was truly part of his family. After explaining to Big Larry that I broke the glass, he suggested that I meet this problem head-on and have a talk with Miss Caggiano. He suggested that I go back to her house and apologize for running through her yard and breaking her glass. Big Larry said he would pay to replace the window. I could work off the cost of the glass by mowing his yard and helping him with small jobs around the house for the next few weeks. I agreed to those generous terms, and he extended his hand to shake mine as if I were an adult. I remember looking down to the ground when I shook his hand. He didn't like that, and said firmly, When a man shakes your hand to make a deal, you look him right in the eyes. I looked up and replied, Yes, sir. That was a valuable lesson he taught me that day. I'll never forget it. It has stuck with me to this day. That evening, we noticed Miss Caggiano pulling into her driveway. Big Larry and I met her as she got out of her car. He greeted her and said, Freddy has something he wants to say to you. So, I accepted responsibility for my reckless and destructive actions. I told Miss Caggiano how I had taken a shortcut through her yard, and when I jumped the retaining wall, I accidentally landed on the glass window that was leaning against it. I apologized for breaking the glass and for being in her yard, and told her Big Larry would help me pay for the damage. Miss Caggiano was visibly upset. She angrily said, You had no business being in my yard. If I ever catch you stepping foot in my yard again, I will have you arrested for trespassing. You're nothing but trouble. Big Larry didn't think my mishap was worthy of her lambasting me the way she had. He intervened and said respectfully, Miss Caggiano, the boy understands he should not have been in your yard, and he has apologized. He's offered to pay for the damages. I don't think it's necessary to threaten him when he's admitted to making a mistake, one which would never happen again. I'm not sure much of what he said mattered to her. She seemed unwavering in her anger at me. As she started walking away, she turned and stated, I will get an estimate to find out how much it'll cost to replace the glass. Then, with rage still in her voice, she continued, And I expect to be paid as soon as possible. Yes, she was furious. She wanted nothing more to do with me or Larry's dad. It seemed rude because Big Larry hadn't done anything wrong. He'd only tried to smooth things over. She turned her back to us and made her way to the front of the house as fast as she could to talk with the workers and assess the damage I had caused. Big Larry put his hand on my shoulder. He crouched down to get eye level with me. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, What you did was an accident and I know you didn't break that glass on purpose. He ruffled my hair a little and continued. You did the right thing by being honest and confronting your mistake. Miss Caggiano's upset right now. In a few days, she'll calm down, and everything will be okay. Let's get out of here and go back to our house. I was more than happy to comply with that idea. As we started back, he leaned it toward me a bit and said, I hope you learned a good lesson today, young man. Promise me you will not run through people's yards anymore. Then he raised his right index finger for emphasis. And above all, 
Stay clear of Miss Caggiano's yard. He followed that with a gentle smile. I answered, I promise I won't go there any more. And I meant it. Chapter 11 The Hearing As we made our way to our seats, next to our schlep of an attorney, I saw my brother Ron enter the courtroom. He seated himself toward the front of the audience next to an attorney from the ACLU. After Judge Caggiano had taken her seat behind the gavel, our attorney and the prosecuting district attorney made their opening statements. Our hearing was finally underway. The discussion was brief. After hearing statements from both sides, the judge decided to hold us without bail until our court date. My brother Ron and the ACLU attorney immediately stood and vocalized their objections to the judge's decision. The scene was like something out of a Perry Mason television show. Judge Caggiano started pounding the gavel, yelling, Order! Order! Order in the court! Who do you think you are opposing my decision in my courtroom? The confident, well-dressed, and assertive ACLU attorney asked, Your Honor, may we approach the bench? As Ron and the attorney confronted the judge, they explained who they were and why they were there. The attorney told the judge that the ACLU had assigned him to monitor our case, and it was evident that our juvenile rights were in jeopardy. He was there on behalf of his agency to follow the proceedings in the courtroom and to protect the rights of the minors. He also explained to the judge that to keep us in jail without a bond was not only unfair, but it was also unconstitutional. The punishment did not fit the crime. The young ACLU attorney had thrown the judge a curveball she was not prepared to handle. She was visibly shaken and had to pause for a moment to gather her thoughts. This was Miss Caggiano's courtroom, and she called the shots. She expected everyone to bow down to her, but she wasn't a fool. The judge took a moment to assess the situation. Realizing the involvement of the ACLU in Washington, D.C. would alter the landscape of these proceedings, she called for a 15-minute recess. She asked for the district attorney to meet with her in her chambers. When Judge Caggiano returned to the courtroom, she reluctantly changed her previous decision and ordered a bond to be set for $10,000. She went on to specify that if the three of us perpetrators could post bond, we would be on house arrest until the court date. With that new agreement, she struck the gavel and dismissed the court. Before we were led back to our jail cells, the outraged ACLU attorney said in a harsh tone, Your Honor, the bail is unreasonable. These kids come from low-income families. To expect them to come up with a $10,000 bond is impossible. With obvious irritation, Ms. Caggiano said with a fierce glance to the attorney, This is my courtroom and you will respect my decision. Court adjourned. Our discussion is over. Please leave my courtroom or I will have you removed. The ACLU attorney was stunned. The judge was out of control. He knew we were in trouble. Our only hope was to get this case moved to a new court with a new judge. The next day, our brother Ron put up the deposit to post our bail. We were free to go home. Ron was in the middle of his transition from being a drill sergeant in Fort Benning, Georgia, to taking his new assignment in Washington, D.C., working at the White House in charge of ceremonies for the president. He was extremely busy traveling back and forth from Fort Benning, Georgia to Fort Myers, Virginia, to arrange for housing for his family. He wasn't in a position to stick around for a long time to deal with our mess. He had helped us immeasurably, and because of his efforts, we were out of jail. Feeling there was not much more that he could do for us at that point, he packed up, said goodbye, and left Clarksdale. He had to get back to his job and family. He promised to stay in contact with Mom daily to get updates on the progress of the case. Our brother had saved the day. We were free at last. But our freedom would be short-lived. Very short-lived. Chapter 12 Arrested on New Charges It felt good to finally be out of that jail cell and be home in familiar surroundings. Our family dog, a large black Labrador retriever mix we called Blackie, was anxious to see us when we walked up to the front door of our house. He had been lying in the dirt next to my little brother Jason. Blackie was watching him play with his toy cars next to the steps of the house. Jason was five years old, ten years younger than me. He was the youngest child in the family. 
Our dog was loyal and protective. Blackie was getting older, probably around eight years old, and we were very attached to him as we raised him from birth. My sister Patty was sitting on the porch doing homework and keeping an eye on my little brother while we went inside to put our things away and relax. Suddenly, we heard a loud scream from Patty. Doug and I ran back outside to see why she was hysterical. Out from under the concrete porch, just a few feet away from where Jason was playing with his cars in the dirt, slithered a large copperhead snake. Copperheads are venomous and could kill a small child. Blackie spotted the snake crawling toward Jason, and without hesitation, he snatched the snake off the ground and threw it several feet away from Jason. Blackie then pounced on the snake, and after a pretty good fight, he finally killed it. If Blackie had not been lying next to Jason when that snake came out from under that porch, there's no doubt he would have been bitten and possibly killed. Blackie's quick response was heroic. We were home for no more than five hours when two police cars pulled over and parked in front of the house. A uniformed officer and a vice squad detective got out and came to the front door. They were looking for Doug and me. When we came to the door, they asked us both to step outside. They explained that we were under arrest for multiple charges, eight new charges. This was out of control. One of the charges was for selling marijuana. I knew the marijuana charge had to be related to the one time Dave asked me to buy him some. I didn't smoke it, and I didn't sell it. Dave was the only link to marijuana. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together. Obviously, Dave Jones was instrumental in this whole frame-up of my brother Doug, Charles, and me. I still didn't understand any of it. Why would Dave set us up to be arrested? What was his motive? Why was Dave so mad when I discovered the camera behind the glass window? The only thing that was clear was that he was doing an excellent job of ruining our lives. We hadn't done anything to deserve this treatment. It was so bizarre and incomprehensible. Our older brother, Davy, was also at home when the two policemen came to rearrest us. Davy overheard everything they said and quickly called his best friend, Marky. He told Marky that we had been rearrested and set up by the guy named Dave at the fix-it shop. Marky was dating a girl named Adele. Adele had a friend named Tony Rodriguez. Tony was the half-brother of Dave at the fix-it shop. Tony would occasionally drop in just to chit-chat with Dave. Adele was with Marky when our brother Davey called to inform Marky of our arrest. Adele told Marky she would ask her friend Tony if he could find out what was going on because she suspected he had been selling marijuana to Dave. She knew Tony smoked weed, and many times he told her he and Dave would get high at the fix-it shop. The news spread like wildfire that Doug, Charles, and I were back in jail, and the situation was getting worse. Dave Jones started getting malicious calls at the shop, some of them death threats. My brother Davey and his best friend Marky became the next targets. Their rights were next to be seriously violated. Whenever they drove anywhere, they were followed by the police. Cops pulled them over twice within four hours, once for a taillight out, and the other because the officer claimed they were swerving across the middle line. The policemen used that excuse to search their vehicle. It was clearly more intentional harassment. Davey and Marky were a few years older than Doug and me. They weren't saints, either. They had their share of fights in the neighborhood and partied a little too hard at times. They liked to smoke weed and have a few beers, but they were part of a group of older kids that protected the neighborhood. It was odd, but as rough as our neighborhood was, people rarely locked their doors. I only remember one murder that happened while I was a kid growing up in that area. It happened on Christmas Eve. That night, the store above the fix-it shop was open for business. A man with his wife and three-year-old child pulled up to the market. The man left his truck running and went in to purchase batteries for one of the Christmas presents under their tree. As the man was in the store, a thug opened the passenger door of his truck, grabbed his wife's purse, and tried to run. The purse strap was wrapped around the lady's arm so it wouldn't break free. The thug stopped wrestling for the bag. With his right hand, he pointed a pistol at the woman's chest and pulled the trigger. He killed her in an instant while their three-year-old daughter watched. The assailant then ran behind the store and disposed of the gun. Hours later, he was apprehended and sentenced to prison. 
It was a horrible incident that branded our neighborhood as a dangerous place to live. It was a danger zone, and fights did happen, often. Unlike a big city such as Chicago, we rarely had an incident where guns were involved. It was usually one-on-one fights, and the neighborhood took care of itself. Davy and Marky were part of the neighborhood watch. So just hours after we posted bail, Charles, Doug, and I were once again back in jail, awaiting a trial date. As they say, when it rains, it pours. The next day, we received more bad news. We were allowed visitation from our mom. When she arrived, it was apparent that something else was upsetting her, besides our predicament. She was visibly unsettled and had a genuinely mournful look on her face. The last thing Mom wanted to do was tell us more bad news. However, in this case, she knew we would want to know. Our dog, Blackie, had died from his entanglement with the copperhead snake. We didn't know it at the time, but when Blackie fought with the snake, he was bitten twice on his snout and once in the rear on his back leg. We were devastated. Within a matter of hours of our getting bonded out of jail, we were rearrested and our beloved dog, our hero, died. Our world had been turned upside down. We had lost our best friend, and we couldn't be there to help bury him or say our goodbyes. As strong as I thought I was, it was impossible to hold back the tears. I cried uncontrollably. It wasn't just over our dog, though I loved Blackie. It was the cumulative effect of everything that was going against us. I was sad that our dog was dead, and I was steaming mad that I was locked up again on even more bogus charges. I was ashamed that I bought weed for Doug's boss and made a profit for doing so. All these emotions were hitting me at once. I think I was on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. I felt like I wanted to die. For a few moments, I sincerely wished that I could end my life to make the pain, the shame, and this entire mess vanish for good. When our mom left, both Doug and I went to our individual cells and lay in our bunks. I must have silently cried for hours until I eventually fell asleep. That was by far the most horrible day of my life. On the eleventh day in jail, we awoke to hear the guards unlocking our cell doors. They came to get Doug to move him out of juvie and into the adult jail. Doug was 16 when he started working at the fix-it shop. He had turned 17 a couple of weeks later. The district attorney, with the permission of the judge, decided to arraign him as an adult, as he was the driver of the vehicle that fateful day we were pulled over after going through a yellow light. Being placed in the adult population could be dangerous. It was certainly a more violent place than the juvenile detainment section. Doug was not confrontational. He was not a fighter. I was worried that he could get seriously hurt by some creep among the adult population. I would have gladly taken his place if they had allowed me. There was nothing I could do to help him, and it made me frustrated. I had no control over this decision. Sure enough, things were going to get dangerous and unpredictable. The following day, my mother and brother Davy returned to the jail for another visitation. Davy needed to tell me about the phone conversation he had with Marky the day before when the cops came to haul Doug and I off again. He explained to me that Marky was dating a girl named Adele who had a friend named Tony Rodriguez. Davy said that Tony was the fix-it man's stepbrother. This was news to me, because until then, Dave Jones had never mentioned that he had any brothers or sisters. Adele told Marky that Tony often visited the fix-it shop where he and Dave would get high together. Following that phone call, Marky and Davy set off to meet Tony. They were hoping to get Tony to spill some details on what Dave Jones was really up to at the fix-it shop. Tony wasn't eager to divulge too much information, other than he wasn't close to his stepbrother Dave. Tony did point out that Dave Jones had served time in the penitentiary and was currently out on parole. Davy told Tony he suspected the fix-it shop was a sting operation, but Tony said it was not possible because they smoked weed there together all the time. If Dave were working undercover, he'd be already arrested because he's the one who sold Dave all the grass and cocaine at the shop. Tony also said if he finds out Dave Jones is working undercover, he will kill him with his own bare hands. This theory made sense. 
It's the only thing that made sense. What else could it be? Davy had no concrete proof that Dave at the fix-it shop was an undercover agent, but he had a powerful gut instinct about it. The day I went into the room behind the dark curtain and saw that camera, Shady Dave's whole operation was in jeopardy if I told anybody about it. I was a witness. My brother Davy put two and two together, arriving at the conclusion that the fix-it shop was a front for a sting operation. Dave was an undercover agent for the police. Davy also suspected that we had been set up and locked away to keep us quiet. By being arrested and confined to jail cells, we couldn't possibly disclose any information about their sting operation. Well, of course, that had to be the answer. It made perfect sense. But it was incredibly unfair to Charles, Doug, and me. Arresting us was a terrible option. Why had they not just told us it was a sting operation and we had to keep quiet about it? They had plenty of better options that wouldn't scar us all so deeply. They could have put us under house arrest or sent us to Fort Benning with our older brother. We weren't just collateral damage. Arresting us the way they did was ridiculous. It seemed like we had finally solved this case on our own, but it was all speculation because we had no proof. The only thing that wasn't adding up was the new information that Dave Jones was an ex-convict. If this was an undercover operation devised by the police department, why would they hire an ex-con to be the head agent? Was that even legal? Chapter 13 Murder On the twelfth day of jail, Doug was brought back to the juvenile detention section. During his time in the adult jail, he had been beaten by two inmates. The thugs wanted his mattress, but Doug refused. Doug wasn't a fighter by nature. He had a friendly, non-threatening personality. No doubt the inmates sensed this and took him for an easy target. I'm sure Doug put up a good fight. When pushed to his limits, he could handle himself as good as anyone. But after the beating he got, the guards decided his life was actually in danger. They needed to get him out of the adult population. Around noon, the guard came and asked Charles to go with him. Doug and I were left to wonder, what's happening now? About an hour later, they brought Charles back to the cell. Then they asked Doug and me to follow them. They took us upstairs and separated us into adjoining rooms. A very straight-faced, stern detective came into my room and began grilling me on Tony Rodriguez. Do you know a man named Tony Rodriguez? I replied, No, sir. I know the name, but I've never met him. And that was the truth. Do you mean to tell me you don't know Dave Jones's brother, Tony Rodriguez? The detective was getting angry and more confrontational. It was severely unsettling. Yes, sir, I know who you're talking about, but like I just told you, I never met the guy. Once again, I was telling the truth. Until Davey told me that Tony Rodriguez was Dave's stepbrother, I had never heard the name. The detective said that Dave's stepbrother was beaten to death yesterday and hung. His limp body was then stuffed into a footlocker. It's awfully coincidental that as soon as we locked you boys up, Dave Jones starts getting death threats at the fix-it shop. Holy crap! Tony was beaten to death! Come on! Did this tough guy seriously think we boys had killed Dave's brother? Mr. Dark, at least that's how I viewed him, continued his preposterous line of questioning. Did you or Doug at any time leave your house between the time we released you from jail and the time my officers brought you back? Again, I replied, No, sir. This fellow made my skin crawl. Do you know anyone who would want to hurt Dave Jones or any of his friends or family? I don't know much about Dave Jones at all, I replied. He didn't open up to any of us. He just gave me and my brother pickup and delivery jobs. I paused to think for a minute and said, Looking back now, everything about Dave was fishy. The reason I'm here is entirely because of him. I don't know anything about this brother of his either. Before all this, I never even heard the name Tony Rodriguez. The creepy detective scribbled some words down on a pad of paper. I continued. We live in a very tough neighborhood. I'm pretty sure that by now, just about everyone around would know that Dave Jones was responsible for our arrest. There are many people pissed off because you are holding three innocent kids. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if someone in the neighborhood is upset enough to retaliate against Dave. 
but I don't think anybody would kill someone over us being in jail. What about your brother Davey and his friend Marky? Do you think they would do something like that? Man, this guy was fishing. If Charles, Doug, and I didn't know that Dave had a brother named Tony, how would Davey and Marky know? My distaste for this man was growing by leaps and bounds. The detective replied, Because we understand your friend Marky is dating a girl named Adele, and she is a close friend of Tony Rodriguez. No, I don't think my brother or Marky would kill someone. Maybe you should be asking Dave Jones these questions. I'm certain he's behind most of this. I was getting a clear picture of how shady and distrustful Dave is. He had no problem setting up me, Doug, and Charles. A guy who would do that is likely to do other dark things. Maybe he killed Tony Rodriguez because he knew too much. Right now, I couldn't care less about what happens to Dave Jones or his family. He's an absolute piece of shit. The detective had heard enough from me. He stood up from the table and said, Fair enough, but if you can think of anyone who might have wanted to do harm to Tony Rodriguez or Dave Jones, I'd appreciate your help. I suddenly realized that he no longer suspected me of having anything to do with the murder of Tony Rodriguez. Like a light switching off, he stopped being aggressive and mean. The tough guy act was just an interrogation tactic. As he was leaving the little room, he said, Sit tight, and I'll get the guard to take you back to your cell. Chapter 14 Eighteenth Day in Jail The next several days were boring and uneventful. Doug, Charles, and I spent our time playing cards and reading books. At some point, Doug noticed a mouse running across the floor and wanted to catch it. He saved some bread from lunch and left crumbs near the hole the mouse used to enter our cell. When the mouse returned, we watched as he cautiously ate the bread. Eventually, the mouse followed the crumb trail until he was near the concrete picnic table. None of us made any sudden movements while Doug dropped the crumbs on the floor. We didn't want to scare the mouse. Eventually, Doug sat down on the concrete floor. The mouse would get within one foot of Doug, allowing him to drop the food without running away. This scenario went on for three days. Finally, the mouse felt comfortable enough around Doug that he climbed onto his pant leg and allowed Doug to touch him. Doug had a new friend. He was the only one the mouse would let touch him. It was the funniest thing to watch the mouse climb up Doug's shirt to rest on his shoulder while he ate his breadcrumbs. Playing with his new friend kept Doug's mind occupied on something positive. It was good entertainment in a place filled with so much negativity. When the mouse wasn't around, my mind was left racing. I was becoming more and more convinced that our brother Davy had been right about this all being a setup to get us off the street so that we wouldn't blow the lid off their operation. It was the only theory that made any sense. On our 18th day in jail, the guard came to our cell and told us to gather all our belongings. They were letting us go home. He didn't have to say it twice. Without hesitation, we started collecting the few clothes and books they allowed us and waited for the guard's return. I remember feeling an enormous level of relief and excitement to get out of that hellhole. Doug and Charles were equally thrilled. They were grinning from ear to ear. The wait seemed like it took forever. We were so eager to be out of there that one minute felt like ten. But wouldn't you know it? We had waited three full hours before he returned to release us. Chapter 15 42 Indicted in Police Sting our parents were waiting in the lobby to take us out of that godforsaken place. On the ride home, they informed us that our brother Davy had been right all along. It was all a low-down setup. When we got home, our mother showed us an article in the local newspaper. In big letters, the headline read, 42 Indicted in Police Sting. The article described how the operation had been based in a fix-it shop on Woodmore Boulevard in Clarksdale, Tennessee. It was involved in the fencing of stolen property. Authorities had begun to round up the 42 perpetrators named in the grand jury indictments. Thirteen of them were arrested the night before the newspaper article came out. The police were searching for 29 others that day. It was such a huge story that the three largest television news channels in our locale were covering the story. 
We watched the 6 o'clock news as they showed actual footage of officers beating on doors, arresting people, and taking them to jail. The media was there in full force outside the jail. Reporters and camera crews were on hand as one carload of criminals after another piled up. Police officers escorted shady-looking individuals in handcuffs into the precinct. The next day, another headline in the local newspaper read, More Sting Suspects Corralled in Spring Roundup. The article stated that more than $103,000 worth of merchandise purchased in the Sting operation cost about $35,000 to buy. Arrest totals had reached 18 by press time that afternoon. The news article listed the names and charges of those indicted. Halfway down the list, I read, 16-year-old, McGraw Street, boy, six counts of grand larceny, receiving and concealing stolen property and selling marijuana. 17-year-old McGraw Street, boy, six counts of grand larceny, receiving and concealing stolen property. 17-year-old Woodmore Boulevard boy, six counts of grand larceny, receiving and concealing stolen property. A chill ran down my spine. The boys listed referred to Charles, Doug, and I. Our names must have been omitted because we were juveniles. This mess was far from being over. The district attorney's office, police department, and judge were all knee-deep in a potential civil rights nightmare. They had violated the rights of three juveniles, so they couldn't drop the charges without a hearing or a court date. If they did, it would be an admission of guilt on their part. That would set the city up for a lawsuit. Thanks to my older brother Ron, the ACLU was monitoring this case closely to make sure they protected our rights. The arrest was quite a problem for the district attorney because he was about to be up for re-election. It was even more of a mess for the chief of police who had helped orchestrate the sting operation we unknowingly got entangled in. We stayed in touch with the lawyer from the ACLU who suggested we take action on a few things immediately. First, we needed to file for a Marsden hearing. There, we could request that the court allows us to fire the attorney they had appointed to represent us. He had not done an acceptable job on our behalf. At the Marsden hearing, we also asked to have Judge Caggiano dismissed because she was not impartial. We needed a change of venue. With our case moved to another court, we would get a different judge. We had plenty of proof to show that the attorney who'd been defending us was not looking out for our best interest. We also had enough character witnesses to testify to the judge's bias. She had a history of anger and resentment toward our family. It took three months after our release from jail, but we were granted the Marsden hearing. It was a closed courtroom, and only a limited number of people associated with the case were allowed in. Judge Caggiano presided over the hearing. How in the world could it be legal and proper for this biased judge to be ruling over a hearing conducted for the express purpose of seeking a different judge and venue? The good old boy system was at it again. During the hearing, the ACLU attorney laid out his arguments to Judge Caggiano. He asked that the charges against all three of us boys be dropped. He argued his point and showed that there was no possible way some of these crimes happened by Charles Doug and me. A prosecuting witness named Mr. Brake stated that on March 7th, two Murray bicycles went missing from his Walmart store. He testified that he had seen the bikes just two hours before they were stolen. The arrest petition stated the fix-it shop bought the stolen bikes on March 4th. The attorney argued that it's not physically possible to take something on the 7th and sell it three days earlier on the 4th. Judge Caggiano denied the request to dismiss the charge. She stated that the witness was simply confused about the dates. She was sure the three of us boys had stolen the bikes. The charge was insane. The judge was vindictive. She ordered a 15-minute court recess to allow the district attorney time to correct the dates and resubmit the amended petitions. Our attorney then contested the amount of bail against the three of us because we had no prior arrests, citations, or convictions. He argued that the sum of the bond was excessive. The judge disagreed, saying that she knew our history from living in the same neighborhood and was certain we were guilty. This was complete insanity. She had all but admitted that she set our bond so high because she was biased against us.
It was a complete miscarriage of justice. The bogus hearing lasted for two hours. The ACLU attorney made his case clear to the judge and stated that he was fully prepared to show the evidence necessary to turn this charade into a full-blown civil rights lawsuit. If we could not get a fair hearing in front of an impartial judge and get represented by a competent attorney, he was going to bring in the full force of the ACLU. The wicked witch of a magistrate began to realize that this lawyer from Washington wasn't going to back down. He wasn't intimidated by her. The good old boy style of law was not going to fly with the ACLU. Realizing the outcome of this case could make her look bad in the public eye and possibly cause significant damage to her career, Judge Caggiano reluctantly agreed to the appointment of new attorneys for us. She also decided to dismiss herself from overseeing the case. She moved it to a new court under a new judge. Our win was undoubtedly a severe blow to her ego and a huge advantage for us. Over the next several weeks, we had meetings with our new attorneys. Doug and I were appointed a very young but a very sharp lawyer by the name of Mr. Randolph. Charles had been appointed a new attorney named Mr. Williams. Both attorneys seemed eager to get to the truth. They worked closely with each other, gathering information about Dave Jones and the facts surrounding our case. There is a whole new dynamic at play. These fellows wanted to make sure we boys were adequately represented. The new lawyers made it clear from the start that they were not part of the good old boy system. They were fresh out of law school and eager to prove to everyone that the charges against us were bogus. We made preparations for our case as we waited for our court date to get on the docket. Our attorneys were proving very good at their jobs. They were doing all they could to ensure that no stone was left unturned. What they discovered while researching Dave Jones and all the officials involved in our case was truly unbelievable. The disgusting truth was about to unfold in the courtroom. Chapter 16. Boot Camp As we waited for the court to determine our trial date, we made every effort to carry on as normally as possible with our lives. Doug and I struggled to deal with all that had transpired over the past few months. Worries weighed heavily on our minds. We became withdrawn from our friends and family. We kept a lot pent up inside, rarely speaking about the case to anyone. We were beginning to have problems interacting with other people, especially anyone who might be considered an authority figure. We didn't trust anybody. How could we? We had been dealt the worst hand imaginable for dealing with that low-down scoundrel Dave Jones. If spoken to in an authoritative manner, our automatic reaction was to be rebellious and outspoken. If someone showed us any disrespect, we turned snappish and verbalized that in no uncertain terms. Would we tolerate being spoken to in such an ill manner? We realized that we both needed help in dealing with our psychological problems. I considered our mental state to be the equivalent of post-traumatic stress disorder. We missed so many days of school while being in jail that it's amazing we were able to pass our exams and graduate, but we did. Thankfully, we weren't held back to repeat that grade. Our mom was a major factor in our not failing that school year. She went to our school while we were in jail and got our homework assignments. She would bring the homework to us on her daily visitations. We would work on them in the slammer, and she would submit our completed assignments to our teachers. Despite being absent for 18 days, Mom's efforts kept us up to date with our schooling. Not long after we got out on bail, the school year ended and summer break was beginning. My brother Ron was finishing his assignment in Fort Benning, Georgia, as a drill sergeant. He was preparing to transition into his new job at the White House in Fort Myers, Virginia. He had been busy setting up arrangements for housing and everything else associated with such a move. He had been dealing with the mess we were involved in during what little spare time he could find. As busy as he was, he still managed to come home for a couple of days to find out firsthand how we were coping with life after jail. The whole family appreciated that. Ron noticed how withdrawn and edgy Doug and I had become. He thought that perhaps some time away from Clarksdale and each other would do us good. He recommended to Mom that I go back with him to Fort Benning for a few days. He encouraged Doug to stay at the farm George Blick's father ran in Kentucky. Doug could work on the farm and hopefully clear his head. 
Mom knew how badly the past few months had taken their toll on us. Escaping from the nightmare, if only for a short time, could be good medicine. She liked Ron's ideas and consented. Leaving town for a few days would be helpful, so Ron walked across the street to discuss his intentions with Mr. Blick. He said he would be happy to have Doug stay at the farm. Mr. Blick welcomed the added help. His father always needed more hands during the summer to work the tobacco fields. Mr. Blick was a good man who liked our family. He thought this arrangement would work just fine. His father lived alone and had always enjoyed Doug's company. They were well aware that Doug was a hard worker, and they sure could use his help. Doug enjoyed working on the farm, so it was in everybody's best interest for this to happen. The next day, I packed a suitcase and headed to Fort Benning with Ron. I was thrilled to spend time away with him. Ron became the hero of the family. I had never lived outside of Clarksdale, never seen a five-lane highway. As we passed through Atlanta, I was in awe of the tall buildings and amazed by the insane amount of traffic. I suddenly realized there was life outside of Clarksdale, Tennessee. Ron explained that we had to go straight to the Army base because he had new recruits serving in basic training. We would have to stay in the barracks for the next three days. I had never been on an Army base. I had no idea what a drill sergeant's job was, other than what I had seen watching the Gomer Pyle show on television. Boot camp was going to be a new experience for me. It was exciting. I was going to witness a side of my brother that I had never seen before. It was dark when we arrived at the Fort Benning military base. It had to be close to 10 p.m. We first went into a barrack that looked similar to an office on the inside. There were several desks, and a few other drill sergeants were there on duty. Ron introduced me to his co-workers and explained that I would be staying on the base with him for a few days. Ron had previously discussed my situation with his commanding officer and was granted approval to bring me back with him. Ron told me to grab my suitcase. He would show me where I would be sleeping for the night. As we walked toward another row of barracks, we heard someone shout out Ron's name. We stopped to find out what the guy needed. Ron pointed to the barracks and instructed me to go there. It's right through the front door, he said. In the back of the barracks is my office. Make yourself comfortable in that room, and I'll see you in the morning. He gestured toward the guy who was approaching us. Right now, I've got some business to take care of with this fellow. The barrack was dark. As I entered through the front door, I could see rows of bunk beds lined up on both sides of the wall. At first, I didn't realize soldiers were sleeping in the beds. It was late, close to midnight, and the guys were sound asleep. The first mistake I made was walking down the middle of the room on a polished hardwood floor. As soon as I made it to the center of the barrack, someone yelled, Get off the fucking floor! I stopped dead in my tracks. The whole place erupted into an onslaught of shouting for me to get off the hardwood. I had no idea what that meant, or why walking through their barracks would cause such a thundering uproar. After all, I was only following Ron's orders. The recruits obviously had no idea who I was. My hair was shoulder length, and it was evident I was not a basic training recruit. One annoyed guy asked in an accusatory tone, Who the fuck are you, and what are you doing here? I replied, My brother, Ron, told me to go through here to his office. The guy immediately changed his tune. Oh, shit! The sergeant is your brother? Yes, I said. Ron's right outside talking to somebody. Everybody in the room got silent. The guy who'd been talking explained, Well, look, I'm sorry I snapped at you, partner, but we spent the whole day polishing that floor. There's an inspection in the morning, so it needs to be spotless. That means we can't have somebody walking around on it with shoes that have just been out on the streets. And there I was, like a dumbass, strolling down the middle of the hardwood without a care in the world. The recruits were pissed. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Well, take your shoes off, okay? Yes, sir, I replied, and did just that. Then I continued walking toward my brother's office in stocking feet. I was relieved to get through that door without anybody else getting mad at me. In the office, where Ron had me wait, I noticed a stereo on the desk. I took a seat and turned the radio on and began to dial through the channels. I found my favorite song. It was a rock song by the band Def Leppard called Bring It On The Heartbreak. I cranked that baby up loud, put my feet on the desk, 
and kicked back into a lounging position. You'd think I'd have known better. It seems so stupid to me now, but my only defense was that I was 16 years old. The barracks erupted once again. The basic training recruits were screaming at me to turn the music off. Suddenly, Ron rushed into the room and yelled at me, Turn that fucking stereo off! Like a fool, I asked, What's the problem? What's the problem? Are you crazy? These guys need sleep. They can't get sleep with that radio blasting. What in the world were you thinking? Keep the radio off. Okay. Sorry about that. Ron shook his head. Look, just don't get crazy around here. It's the U.S. Army. Show a little respect. Now, get some sleep, because you're waking up early and going with me. I hadn't been thinking about what I was doing. I just wanted to hear my music. Dumb kid. Lucky for me, Ron let it go. Somehow, I managed to fall asleep in the office chair with my feet kicked up on the desk. At 4 a.m., Ron entered the room and tossed a shirt and a pair of shorts to me. Put these on and meet me outside, he ordered, matter-of-factly. After the events of the night before, I wasn't about to question him. I put the clothes on and walked outside where I saw all his new recruits lined up in formation. He was shouting at them like they were dogs. One by one, he would get in their faces and yell at them while pecking them on the bridge of their nose with the brim of his round drill sergeant hat. I had never witnessed this side of my brother's personality. It looked like a scene straight from the Gomer Pyle TV show. My brother's demeanor was harsh. I hate to say it, but he was a total asshole to those guys. I couldn't understand why he needed to be so rude. But I knew it was none of my business, and I let it go without saying anything about it to him. After he dressed down the recruits, Ron told me we were going to load everyone in what resembled a cattle wagon. I'm not sure what the proper name was for that boxcar, but to me, it resembled something that was used to haul cattle on a farm. This one, however, was hauling recruits to a place called Sand Hill. I climbed into the wagon along with all the soldiers. We were crammed into this thing, shoulder to shoulder, ass to ass. When we got to our destination, I noticed it was a large sand track. Ron grabbed a bullhorn to announce to everyone that the kid with the long hair is his brother. I'll tell you this, he shouted to them all. My brother is in better shape than any of you maggots here in basic training. Ron knew I was physically fit. I had been on the city boxing league and had to run five miles each day during training. He was aware that only a few of his new recruits could keep up with me. So he shouted through his bullhorn to them. Okay, we're going to run two miles in the sand. Any of you who cannot keep up with Freddy will have hell to pay. Ron looked at me and said, Fred, I want you to show these idiots how to run. He gave me a little smile and then shouted, Take off, now! Ron knew I liked that kind of a challenge, and I was up for it. Without any hesitation, I took off running as fast as I could around the sand track. I was, after all, the bionic man, right? Ron gave the go-ahead for the recruits to take off after me. I had an unfair advantage. Not only had Ron given me a slight head start, but I was wearing tennis shoes. The soldiers were wearing army boots. As I finished rounding my first lap, I was already beginning to catch up to some of the slower recruits. The course was elevated and lit up with lights just like you would see in a stadium. I remember it sloped downhill on one side. After several laps, some of the exhausted troops sat down on the grass where the slope kept them out of sight from all the drill sergeants. Running in deep sand was possibly the most exhausting workout I had ever attempted. Two miles of that sand was probably the equivalent of running five miles on pavement. After the run, we loaded up and headed back to the barracks. Ron told me we would be going to the mess hall for breakfast. I would need to sit at his table with the other drill sergeants. The mess hall was set up like a buffet line. You picked up your silverware and tray. As you walked down the line, servers would load your plate with food. I took my seat at Ron's table and began to eat my breakfast when all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Once again, Ron started yelling at one of the new recruits for talking. He stood right up close to the poor fellow and screamed right into his ear at the top of his lungs. Another drill sergeant joined in and started screaming in the guy's other ear. 
they told the recruit to go outside and eat his food by himself. I thought, damn, my brother is a prick. This guy had simply talked to one of his friends, and for that, they screamed at him. I didn't understand how basic training worked, that was for sure. I couldn't understand why Ron had to yell to get his point across. When Ron got back to the table and sat next to me, I asked, Was it necessary to scream at that guy? Don't you think you could have handled that situation a little better? Did you have to put him down in front of his friends? Ron looked at me with a puzzled glare. He didn't know if I was serious or joking. He just put his head down and started shaking his head from side to side. The other drill instructors started laughing. We finished breakfast, and the rest of the day Ron was busy with inspections and harassing the new recruits. This left me free to roam around to the base and explore it some. One of the recruits told me they had a store, the PX, which was within walking distance. I had a little cash on me, so I thought I'd go check it out. I walked to the PX and bought a Coke and a Snickers bar, and then walked back to the barracks. When I got back, the recruits were taking a break in front of the building. Most of them were just sitting around. I wasn't entirely aware of how grueling basic training was on them, so I didn't quite understand why they all looked at me like a lion drooling over a piece of meat. There I was, the envy of all, roaming freely with my long mane, ice-cold coke in one hand, and a decadent candy bar in the other. They were not allowed to go to the PX, so they had not had any junk food for weeks. Later that day, we were shuttled off to a new destination on the base that appeared to be a firing range. This was where the recruits trained on how to fire a tow missile. The tow was an optically tracked, wire-guided missile used to destroy tanks. About two miles away stood the target, a junked-out old tank. You could barely see the tank with the naked eye. To the naked eye, it just looked like a dot in the field. It was so far away. One of the soldiers performed a demonstration and fired a missile at the tank. Bullseye! The missile hit the tank and exploded. I've never witnessed anything that powerful in my life. It was truly an amazing sight to behold. Ron and I left the barracks later that afternoon and headed to his house. Although being on base with Ron and watching him work was an exciting new experience, I couldn't wait to go to sleep in the comfort of a real bed. Ron had two kids, a son named Brian and a daughter named Christina. They were playing in the yard when we arrived. His wife, Carmen, was sitting outside. In my opinion, she was the sweetest lady on earth. She would always greet you with a warm hug and a huge smile. Ron and Carmen met in high school, and they secretly dated. Carmen was a beautiful, light-skinned lady of African-American descent. In the 1970s, interracial dating was not accepted by many, especially in the South. I'm sure Ron and Carmen were both regularly catching grief from schoolmates and adults alike, but they didn't care what others thought of them. They were blind to skin color and had positive attitudes. All that mattered to them was the fact that they were young and they loved each other. They were determined to raise a family and give their kids the opportunities they didn't have as kids. For several weeks, I got to spend some real quality time getting to know Carmen and the kids better. I hadn't spent much time with Ron and his family before this visit because the military had deployed him to Germany for three years. After that, as a drill sergeant, he never seemed to get enough time off to visit us back home. Ron was ten years older than me, so when he left home to enter the Army, I was only six or seven years old. I don't have many memories of Ron as a kid. As summer break was ending, and Ron was shuffling back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Fort Benning, Georgia, I was ready to return to Tennessee and start my junior year of high school. The weight of the unresolved court case and pending charges slowly started to creep back in. Spending time with Ron's wife and kids had helped take my mind off the turmoil of events during the previous months. I had stopped thinking about everything associated with the case for a short time. But I knew it wasn't over. I had to refocus. A week before the new school year began, I made the trip back to Tennessee with Ron and his family. They planned to stay a few days to visit with Carmen's parents and the rest of our family. I was a little sad that I would no longer get to spend time with Carmen and Ron. I had developed a close bond with Carmen. Saying goodbye was not going to be easy. 
Chapter 17 The Bullies As we were driving down my street, I noticed two kids walking in front of our house. I'd never seen them before. When we got out of the car, the two kids stopped to gawk at Ron and Carmen as if they had never seen an interracial couple before. They slowly walked away. I remember how odd that felt. We went into the house. Mom and Dad were both excited to see Carmen and the kids. We all sat around the table for hours, catching up on what had been going on with Ron's family. My parents were intrigued by Ron's new assignment at the White House. They wanted to hear all the details about his promotion. They were proud of their son, to say the least. The days following my return home were curious. I kept seeing those two new faces that had moved into the neighborhood. They would walk past our house every day. Even when they saw me in the yard, they never stopped to talk or introduce themselves. I felt a bad vibe every time I saw those two kids. They looked about the same age as me. Both of them were tall and slim, with long hair and tattoos on their arms. Unlike these days, it was unusual in 1982 to see a teenager with tattoos. It was evident to me that these new kids were not from around here. They looked different, and they had an arrogant swagger in their walk. Something was not right with them. I was getting an odd feeling that I would probably soon have a face-to-face -face meeting with these questionable individuals. I was not looking forward to it. Summer break had nearly ended. Our first day of the new school year was just two days away. Doug was now back from working all summer in the tobacco fields. He had lost his job at the stable's steakhouse after he was arrested and put in jail. His manager, Jim, was forced to hire someone else. Doug spoke with him to try to get his job back, but Jim was leery. Jim told Doug he was the best worker the steakhouse had ever had, but because of the pending charges, he couldn't hire him back. Doug understood and appreciated him for taking the time to talk. He told Jim we were going to beat this case and prove to everyone we were not guilty. Jim said, I hope you're right. If you do, and I have an opening, I will hire you back in a heartbeat. Doug had saved his money over the summer and wanted to go shopping for new school clothes. He knew I didn't have any money, so he told me that if I wanted to go with him to shop, he would pay for it. Of course, I agreed to that. What a deal. We loaded into the old gas-guzzling van and headed to the mall. I asked him if he had noticed the new kids who had been walking around the neighborhood. He said he had not met them, but he heard they had been trying to pick a fight with Jeff and Bobby, two of our friends who lived in the neighborhood. Doug said he heard the new guys were brothers and moved here from Florida. The kids bragged that they were trained in martial arts. They didn't get along with anyone in the neighborhood and were constantly looking for trouble. I told Doug we needed to stay away from those guys. We couldn't afford to get into any trouble while we were waiting for our court case to begin. The next Monday morning, we awoke and got ready for our first day of school. Doug was starting his senior year. I was beginning my junior year. We got in Doug's van, and he drove us to school. That first day was uneventful. I kept to myself and made it through all my classes with no problems. Doug was still in the co-op program that allowed him to get out of school in the middle of the day. As Doug left early, I had to ride the school bus home. It was good to see our old pal Shaky driving the bus. I sat next to Charles, who was already sitting in the seat behind Shaky. As the bus slowly filled up with kids, the two brothers who'd moved into our neighborhood climbed aboard. They each had a lit cigarette in their hands. Shaky saw this and immediately said, Hey, 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 you can't get on this bus with lit cigarettes. What is wrong with you guys? One of the brothers, whose name was Daryl, snapped back. Chill out, old man. It's just a cigarette. He turned and flicked the cigarette out the door. He took one step and stopped next to me. He turned to his brother, whose name was David, and said, Look who we have here. It's the kid with the nigger-loving brother. I shot straight up and was toe-to-toe -to -toe with this obnoxious, racist idiot. If you have a problem with me, we can get off this bus right now and handle it. Charles and Shaky both intervened. Shaky told Daryl and David to sit in the back of the bus or they would be kicked off. 
Charles started doing his best to calm me down, saying, Dude, don't do this. Settle down. You can't get into any trouble. Let it go. These guys aren't worth the headache. I knew he was right, so I sat back down and tried to shrug it off. My temper flared, but I did my best to handle it by going silent. My blood was boiling, but nobody knew. This idiot just disrespected me in front of my friends. I couldn't let that slide. The whole bus ride home, all I could think about was getting that guy back for the rude comment he made. As the bus pulled up to my stop, the jerk brothers, Daryl and David, began to exit. Shaky turned toward me and, putting his arm out to gently block my way, said, Freddy, you're not getting off at this stop with those boys. I'm taking you to the next stop. I don't want you to get in any more trouble. Let it go. As Daryl and David passed me and started down the steps to exit the bus, David turned and said, See you tomorrow, pretty boy. I said nothing back to him. I just put my hand in the air and flipped him my middle finger. Shaky shut the doors on the bus and took off down the road. Those boys are trouble, Freddy. Don't let them get in your head. I know what you're thinking, but nothing good can come out of fighting with them. Shaky knew all about the sting operation. He was aware that we still had charges pending that we had to face in court. He took a detour from the regular bus route to take me straight to my house. He wanted to make sure I got home without getting into an altercation with Daryl and David. My father was sitting at the dining room table cutting vegetables when I walked in the front door. From where he was sitting, he could see out the screen door. When he caught sight of the bus, he asked me why it had stopped in front of the house. He knew that was not the usual routine. I told him two new guys in our neighborhood were trying to make trouble. They walked past the house when Ron and Carmen were here a few days ago. They're racist. They sought to pick a fight with me on the bus and called Ron a nigger lover. Shaky wouldn't let me off the bus at the same stop as them. He got me home to keep me from getting in a fight. Dad replied, That was nice of Shaky, but this is going to be a problem. You cannot get into a fight with these boys while you are waiting to go to court over your charges. I know. I held my tongue and let it slide. I didn't know if I would be able to keep letting it slide if they kept it up. I wasn't going to let them insult my family or humiliate me in front of my friends. The next morning, Doug and I picked up Charles. We told Doug what happened on the bus with the two brothers. Doug suggested we confront the brothers and arrange to meet them after school. Doug was mad. He thought the world of Ron and Carmen and was not about to let this go. We figured the best place for such a meeting was in the big field near our house. He thought we should handle this situation in private. No weapons, no witnesses, just the two of them against the two of us. He wanted a fair fight. During the lunch break, Doug, Charles, and I were standing outside the school in a designated smoking area. Seems hard to believe now, but back in 1982, our education system allowed smoking in a designated area outside. I did not smoke, but Doug and Charles had recently picked up the habit. So there we were, just hanging out, when Daryl and David walked up. Once again, the pricks started harassing us about Ron and Carmen, making racial slurs about them. Apparently, they had more anger and brashness than brains. Did they seriously think that we were no threat to them? Were they as tough as they led people to believe? Doug kept his cool while I was silently about to blow a gasket. A whole bunch of students started gathering around, thinking a fight was about to break out. Doug spoke first. If you guys have a problem with us, we can meet in the field near the bus stop and settle this once and for all. One of the brothers, David, laughed and said, Yeah. I bet you two would love to get us alone with you. I bet you asked lots of guys to meet you alone with them. I couldn't believe how stupid this jerk was. Doug remained calm and said, Whenever you little boys are ready, just let us know. We will meet you any place and any time, but we're not going to fight you with any witnesses. This fight will be between you and us. Without intending anything of the sort, we had quite a show going on. The crowd of kids surrounding us had swelled to probably fifty or more. The principal, Mr. Goodrich, made his way through the crowd to intervene. Okay, everybody, he commanded firmly. Break it up. The party's over. 
The argument and potential fight were on hold for the time being. Mr. Goodrich knew Doug and me, but he didn't know these obnoxious new kids. Goodrich continued, Everyone back to your classes now, and you two, he pointed at Doug and me, come with me to my office. We went back inside and made our way down the hallway to the principal's office. Mr. Goodrich pointed to the chairs by a wall. Have a seat, young men. Now, I want to know what's brewing between you and these two other boys. Doug explained how they harassed us because our older brother is in an interracial marriage. Daryl and David are racist, and we have no tolerance for it. He said, we're not going to put up with their insults and taunts. They keep running their mouths trying to humiliate us in front of our friends. Doug went on to explain how those brothers were trying to lure us into a fight and how we wanted to take them up on it to teach them a lesson. They went around school bragging about knowing martial arts. Apparently, they wanted to prove to everyone that they were the new badasses in town. They were looking to make trouble. Doug told the principal how we had no intentions of fighting on the property, but we couldn't let them keep on doing what they were doing. Goodrich understood the point of what Doug was saying, but he couldn't condone a fight. Warning us about the added trouble such a thing could cause, he said, I know you boys were involved in the sting operation a few months ago. You realize if you get caught fighting, it will not look good for either of you when you go to court. You both really should stay away from these brothers. Do not let them lure you into a fight. I know it's hard, and I know they're trying to push your buttons, but even if you managed to shut them up, you might be sorry in the end, understood? We reluctantly answered, Yes, sir, we understand. But deep down, we didn't agree with the principal's assessment of the situation. He dismissed us. We left his office and headed back toward our classes. Doug and I stepped out of that office with a strong feeling of dissatisfaction. Doug abruptly stopped at the top of the mezzanine and put his hand on my shoulder. He told me that I was not to get on the bus after school. He said he would come back to school to pick me up. I know you too well, Freddy. I know that if you get on that bus and those two idiots harass you, there will be a fight. He was more convinced by Mr. Goodrich's speech than I had been. We've got to stay away from these assholes, or we will be back in jail. It's not worth it. Okay, okay, I reluctantly agreed. I didn't like this at all. At the end of the school day, the bell rang, and Doug was parked outside to pick me up. On the ride home, we didn't say much about what had transpired earlier in the smoking area. When we got home, Dad, once again, wondered what was up. He knew it was not normal for Doug to pick me up from school. Okay, boys. What happened today? Did those neighbor kids harass you again? Yep, it happened again. Do I need to come to school and talk with Mr. Goodrich about this? No, Dad, Doug said. We already told Goodrich everything. We were having an argument in the smoking area. He broke it up and took us to his office. He wanted to know what was going on, so we told him. Our dad could be rational when he was not drinking. But if he had a few beers in him, you never knew what he was about to say. Lucky for us, on this day, Dad was rational. He reiterated what we already knew. Stay away from those boys and don't let them draw you into a fight. But Dad, I said, how do you stay away when these guys track us down and try to humiliate us in front of everyone? I know it's tough, but you don't have a choice. You've got to be on your best behavior. Your record must stay clean because of those charges you have pending in court. We were frustrated, but we knew he was right. As hard as it was going to be, we agreed that we would do as told. The next day at school, we headed to the lunchroom for our meal period. Doug and I grabbed trays and loaded our plates with crappy cafeteria food. We found a large round table with two available chairs and sat down to eat with some friends. As I was shoveling a mouthful of greasy pizza, I suddenly sensed that someone was standing behind me. I turned around and there stood the two scumbag brothers, David and Daryl. They started running their mouths again about how Doug and I were cowards, and our brother Ron was a nigger lover. As hard as that was to listen to, I bit my tongue and turned back around to finish eating my lunch. Doug and I did not respond to their taunting. We made our best effort to remain quiet while they proceeded to humiliate us in front of everyone. 
the ignorant rednecks continued to berate us for about ten minutes. It felt like a lifetime, sitting there in that cafeteria, surrounded by our friends and peers. Doug and I held fast and remained quiet. I hated the fact that we must have looked like cowards in front of everyone. At this point, many of our schoolmates had no idea that Doug and I were involved in the sting operation and had pending charges. They didn't understand our predicament and how bad it would be if we got into any more trouble. It wasn't like us just to sit quietly while someone provoked us like that. We were expected to defend ourselves. When we got home that evening, our father was drinking his beer and cutting vegetables at the dining table. He'd already downed a six-pack. Doug and I knew to tread softly. Dad took one look at us and could tell something else had happened at school today just by the look on our faces. It's those brothers from Florida again, isn't it? We nodded our heads. Yes. I was so angry inside that I began welling up with tears. Dad could see how much this was bothering me. I'd gotten to the point where I was now becoming emotional just talking about it. Dad began to get mad himself. Like I said before, when my dad was sober, he was rational. When he drank beer, he was unpredictable and could even get violent sometimes. As he was looking down at the vegetables he was chopping with a butcher knife, he asked, Did those boys humiliate you in front of your schoolmates? Once again, we said nothing. We only turned our heads down in shame and nodded affirmatively. And did you take all their crap without responding like your principal and I asked you to do? Again, we nodded. Yes. Dad put the knife down on the cutting board. Okay, time to face this situation. Doug and I looked at each other, knowing things were about to change. We listened attentively to what our father said. Tomorrow, during school, I want you to find those boys. I want you to confront them and let them know the bullshit stops today. You don't allow anyone to humiliate you at any time. You both have tried to stay away from these assholes, but they continue to go out of their way to try to embarrass you. I'm giving you both permission to take this matter into your own hands. If your school principal, Mr. Goodrich, isn't going to do anything to stop this harassment, it's time for you to resolve it. Doug and I liked what we were hearing. Our eyes connected with an agreement. Dad continued, You hunt those boys down and humiliate them just like they've humiliated you. Send a clear message to anyone watching. You won't allow disrespect. No one is going to talk to you like that and get away with it. I find out you got your asses kicked be ready to get yours kicked by me. You're better than that. You can take on those bullies. Am I making myself clear? We both replied, Yes, sir. What a change of events. Doug and I went to our bedroom. We couldn't believe we had just been given the green light by our dad to end the bullshit that Daryl and David created. We figured we would most likely get suspended for fighting. We also understood that getting into a fight at school could affect the upcoming court charges. But that wasn't as important to us at that moment as it was to putting an end to the humiliation that Daryl and David had been dishing out. Our lives had gotten even more complicated than ever before. We still had the unresolved legal issues pending against us and an upcoming court date. Yet there we were, knowingly on the verge of sabotaging our freedom by purposefully starting a fight that was likely to get us suspended. Add to this... Our father was condoning our self-destruction. At that moment, we honestly didn't care about what would happen later. Those two morons were going to get what they deserved. That was all that mattered to Doug and me right then. Chapter 18. Battle of the Brothers The next morning, we arrived at school like any other day. On the way, we picked up Charles and filled him in on what our dad directed us to do. He was both surprised and glad to hear it. We parked the van and headed directly to the smoking area. There must have been a hundred kids gathered around. Doug and Charles each fired up a cigarette while I scanned the smoking area. I noticed Daryl with his arm around his girlfriend. He, too, was smoking a cigarette. He looked intimidating with his scruffy, unshaven face, long hair, and tattoos on both arms. Daryl wore blue jeans with a big wallet tucked into his back pocket. 
and had a silver chain attached to the leather and wrapped around his hip to a side belt loop. He had biker boots on, even though he didn't own a motorcycle. The night before, Doug and I lay awake in our bunks. We didn't want to disturb our other brothers, so we whispered conspiratorially back and forth as we debated over which brother each of us would take on. Doug decided he wanted to fight Daryl. He was pretty tall, at about six foot three. That left David for me. After spotting Daryl in the smoking section, I looked at Doug. There's your boy. He's standing in front of the middle entry doors with his arm around his girlfriend. Doug nodded to me. I guess this is it, boys. It's time for the show. Doug took a drag from his cigarette and walked over to the far right side of the entry doors. With his cigarette still in hand, he ducked inside and immediately came back out through the door on the far end of the entry. From there, he was able to approach Daryl from behind. Doug grabbed Daryl by the back of his hair and pulled him down to his level. He took his cigarette out of his mouth and extinguished it into the top of Daryl's head. Doug did it so quickly that Daryl didn't know what was happening. He was caught off guard and so startled that he pissed in his blue jeans. Daryl didn't have time to react before Doug unleashed a fury of blows to his face. Daryl managed to break free and ran around a concrete column trying desperately to get away from Doug. Doug was quick and stayed right on his tail, pounding him as often as he could. The vice principal had been standing just inside the entry doors. He heard the commotion and came running outside. He caught up to Doug and threw his arms around him to help prevent any more blows. Doug's job was over. He did what Dad had advised him to do. He'd beaten the crap out of the self-proclaimed martial arts master. Tough boy Daryl wet his pants, and everybody witnessed it. It was the craziest fight I had ever witnessed. I loved it. Now it's my turn, I thought, as I watched the vice principal take Doug and Daryl to the office. I was still outside, standing in the smoking area, when Charles walked up and told me he found Daryl's brother, David. He's inside the cafeteria with his girlfriend. He doesn't know that his brother just fought with Doug. I smiled slyly and said, Here we go, boys. It's time for round two. I marched into the school cafeteria with blood in my eyes. David saw me approaching and took his arm away from his girlfriend. Everybody suspected another fight was about to go down. A crowd started gathering. Boy, I guess we were the big entertainment at school that day. I stopped approximately ten feet away from David. He knew something was about to happen. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, Do you have something you need to talk about, pretty boy? Yes, I guess you could say that, I replied. Your bullshit stops right now. The jerk stood up and put his fists into a boxing posture and positioned himself into what looked like a karate stance. He and his brother sported similar looks. This one also stood about six foot three inches tall and had long shoulder-length hair with tattoos on his neck and arms. He had an intimidating look as well, but I didn't fear him. With his fists in front of his face, he extended both index fingers, motioning me to come forward. He smiled and said, Come on, pretty boy, show me what you got. The crowd backed up to give us room to fight. I punched David so quickly he never saw it coming. The first blow struck him in the face and broke his nose. He hit the ground, dazed and confused. His cocky demeanor erased in an instant. As he tried to get up, blood started gushing out of his nose. It showed in his eyes, too. I hit that bastard with a knockout punch I had been trained to do while in the city boxing league. Our fight barely got started, and I knew this fool didn't stand a chance. I was going to tear him apart. The rage I felt was intense. As David struggled to get back on his feet, he was blinded by another punch. Unaware that I was right in front of him, I kicked him in the face as if it were a soccer ball. His body lunged backward and slammed up against a stainless steel cafeteria serving table. Nobody interrupted the fight. I had already done more than enough damage to make my point. I probably should have stopped, knowing I'd won, but I hated this jerk. 
I wanted to give him a lesson he'd never forget. I began kicking him in his ribs while pinned against the serving table. I didn't realize that Gloria, my best friend Larry's sister, had been watching the whole fight. As I was kicking David, she started screaming for me to stop. She could see I was out of control. David was, at this time, severely injured and gasping for air. I heard her voice and somewhat came to my senses. If Gloria hadn't called out to me, I might have gone too far. In truth, I already had. I stopped the beating and walked away. Teachers were trying to get through the crowd of kids. It seemed to me like there were hundreds of students watching. When they reached David, I heard one of the teachers yell, Call an ambulance! David was hurt pretty badly. He had several broken ribs, a broken nose, and was gasping for air. I hate to think that if I hadn't stopped, I might have killed the guy. There was no sense in me trying to run. I knew the punishment for fighting was inevitable, so I headed to the principal's office, where I knew Doug already was. I looked like I had come from a slaughterhouse. My fist was covered in blood, as were my shoes and pants. I walked into the principal's office and sat down beside Doug. Mr. Goodrich couldn't believe what he saw. He said, "'Tell me you didn't fight with the other brother.' I nodded my head. Yes, I did. The vice principal popped his head in the office. Mr. Goodrich, an ambulance is on the way. That other boy is pretty seriously hurt. Goodrich nodded. Thanks, as the man departed. The principal shook his head. I'm disappointed with you two boys. I told you to stay clear of Daryl and David, but no, you wouldn't listen. I stated my case. Well, we came to you and told you this was likely to happen. You knew this would turn into a big deal, but you did nothing to stop the harassment. Did you expect us just to let them humiliate us in front of our friends every day? Now look here, Goodrich replied. Not finished, I interrupted Goodrich, mid-sentence. You need to do what you need to do to punish us. We get that. But we did what we had to do to stop being humiliated. And I'm not sorry for it. Those jerks got exactly what they deserved. Goodrich called our parents to the school. Dad told Goodrich the same thing we said to him. My boys confided to you about the harassment, yet you did nothing. It was getting worse every day. I finally gave them my permission to confront the brothers and end the nonsense. Mr. Goodrich realized that he wasn't going to get the reaction from my parents that he'd hoped. I think our principal knew, deep down inside, that those boys were bullies and got what was coming to them. But as the school administrator... He could not condone the violence. He said, I'm sorry, I have no choice with things the way they are. I'm giving all four of the boys involved a 10-day suspension for fighting. That was the extent of the parent-teacher meeting. It was rather strange that our parents were not upset with us about the situation. They calmly got up to leave, saying, We'll see you boys at home. Our school had a program called In-School Suspension. Mr. Goodrich knew that if he expelled us, our grades would suffer, so he allowed us to stay in school and report to the in-school suspension class for the next ten days. David and Daryl had been so humiliated in the fight, they couldn't face their classmates. They both quit school and never came back. Their parents obviously had no control over them, because most would never allow such a thing. But then, those two boys were such delinquents they most likely never had any parental rules or discipline. Frankly, Doug and I didn't care what happened to them. We were glad they were gone. My brother and I didn't celebrate or gloat. We weren't exactly proud of what we had done. It was just a means to an end. We mostly kept to ourselves after that. Few people, if any, knew just how much we were suffering inside, emotionally and mentally. I suppose, in a way... There was one positive result from the big confrontation. Word spread around school about how well my brother and I had handled ourselves in the double fight. Nobody challenged Doug or me for the rest of the school year. It was understood that we would not back down from anyone. Chapter 19. Metal Shop Our court date was fast approaching. Doug and I were busy with our daily routine consisting of school and working odd jobs. We were doing our best to stay out of trouble. 
One of my favorite classes in school was metalworking occupations. The course was offered at the vocational technical school on the north side of town. We were bussed there and back for half the day. I had a great instructor named Mr. Raleigh who went out of his way to teach me how to weld and create things out of metal. Mr. Raleigh allowed his students the freedom to try making anything we could imagine. He helped us bring our creations to life and assisted us in blueprinting our ideas. One day, I stumbled upon a clever solution to an ongoing problem in our neighborhood. We had trouble with animals tipping over trash cans at night in their search for food. Countless mornings, I would step outside only to find the scavenged contents of our trash strewn all over the yard. We didn't know for certain if the culprits were dogs, raccoons, or foxes, but something out there was making a repulsive mess, which I always had to clean up. I wanted to stop the critters responsible for the reoccurring capers. My solution was to create a metal stand that had a four-foot post welded to a square metal base. I would set a trash can on the stand and send a low-voltage charge through the metal using a car battery. The electrical charge wouldn't harm an animal, but it would shock them if they stood on the metal base. The electric current was equivalent to what farmers use in their electric fence to keep cows in their fields. Eager to find out if my new invention would work, I took it home and installed it. Victory! I no longer had to do trash cleanup in the front yard. My invention worked so well that I made several more for our neighbors so they could keep their trash cans from being tipped over as well. With the trash no longer an issue, my tarnished reputation quickly began to fade. As more and more of my family, friends, and neighbors learned of my creative problem-solving and newly acquired skills as a welder, they began to see me in a positive light. I had become beneficial to the community. I realized how good it felt to be able to utilize my skills for something productive and worthwhile. It gave me purpose. My next constructive project came soon after. Dad told me his cousin raised hogs, but couldn't keep fresh water in their trough. He said they didn't have a pond, so he had been running a garden hose to a plastic kiddie pool to keep the hogs supplied with fresh water. The main drawback to using a kiddie pool was that the hogs enjoyed getting in it to slosh around. They would contaminate the water and eventually damage the plastic, deeming the pool worthless. It didn't take me long to figure out a simple solution to his problem— Back at the metal shop, I fabricated a water trough out of stainless steel so that it would not rust. I attached a stainless steel water holding tank and installed a floater inside the reservoir, similar to what is used to regulate water in a toilet tank. A garden hose could then be attached to the outside of the holding tank. Fresh water poured into the trough as the reservoir emptied, keeping the water level regulated. I designed the bowl so the hogs could only stick their heads in to drink preventing them from contaminating the water. Hundreds of gallons of water would be saved because the hogs would no longer be slopping around in it. Looking back, I never realized then how valuable Mr. Riley's welding class had been or how it would alter my life. My newly found welding skills became an outlet for me. My mind was always running, figuring out ways to improve or create something useful. I loved coming up with constructive solutions. It was more than just a hobby— it was a great distraction from the upcoming court battle. It also helped me to restore my self-esteem, something I had lost over the past few months. I was beginning to feel useful and needed. One day, outside the welding shop, I noticed a large green metal dumpster that was completely rusted out around the bottom. The city's public works department had just dropped the empty container in exchange for the full one. As I inspected the dumpster, I noticed it was designed with poor drainage. When it rained, the dumpster would hold water and, over time, would rust out the bottom. I brought this to the attention of my teacher, Mr. Raleigh. As we both inspected the dumpster, I pointed out the flaw in the design of the drain holes, which prevented the rainwater from escaping. I asked Mr. Raleigh if he knew what the city did with the dumpsters after the rust got so bad that the bottoms were falling out. He explained to me that they would take them to the scrapyard and throw them away. That made no sense to me. I said I could repair the dumpster and asked him if that was okay. My idea was to cut out the rusted metal with a torch, replace it with new metal, and fabricate a shield above the drain holes that I would drill into the floor pan. 
This would prevent the holes from getting clogged with debris. When I was finished with the metalwork, I would send the dumpster to the auto body class located in the same building. The kids could paint the dumpster as they were practicing painting a car. Metal was metal, right? Mr. Raleigh thought it was a great idea. He got in touch with the city, and they granted me permission to begin the project. From start to finish, the dumpster restoration took only three days for me to complete. Mr. Raleigh taught us how to do a cost analysis for fixing the rusted-out dumpster compared to buying a brand new one. He was able to get the city to disclose how many dumpsters they scrapped each year because of rust and damage, as well as how many new ones they purchased. The money they could save by repairing the dumpsters versus the expense of buying new ones was substantial. We had stumbled on a solution to two problems. We could save the city thousands of dollars per year by repairing these dumpsters. And, in the process, we would teach students how to weld and paint. The city funded the vocational technical school, so having the students repair city property as part of their training was a win-win solution for all involved. It was such a successful idea that Mr. Raleigh and the head of the city maintenance department contacted the local newspaper about it. Reporters came to my welding class and interviewed me. Mr. Raleigh and I posed for a picture, and they published an article in the newspaper. I have to admit, I had mixed emotions about helping the city save money. After all, this was the same city that held me in jail on charges that I didn't commit. Yet, there I was, doing just that, helping them save money. Something didn't seem quite right about that. But my teacher wasn't one of the individuals involved in the sting, nor was the head of the city maintenance department. Neither were they part of the corruption. I had to put my negative feelings about our city officials aside and move forward with my life. I had a new purpose in helping to find solutions to problems when I came across them. I was a problem solver, not a problem maker. Despite having this new outlet as a reprieve from everything that happened and what lay ahead, everything was not well. Doug and I were still suffering internally. We rarely talked about what had happened. We stifled our emotions and kept our thoughts and fears bottled up inside. We remained withdrawn and isolated from people, even our closest friends. We did our best to focus more on our schoolwork. We made concerted efforts to get our grades back up to acceptable levels. Doug would also help me with my crazy invention ideas. His input made a big difference when I was trying to figure out how to regulate the amount of electricity to send to the steel plate for the trash can invention. Not only was it invaluable to be able to bounce my ideas off somebody, but he had good ones of his own. These crazy designs of ours were bizarre ideas, but they kept our minds occupied. And they were fun. Chapter 20 Suicide Doug and I were not the only ones suffering. The Clarksdale Police Department was still harassing our brother Davey and his best friend Marky. It seemed to me like every week we would hear a new story about Marky being pulled over by the police and searched without any justifiable cause. They stopped him for no real reason other than that the crooked police department wanted to put pressure on him. Marky believed the police thought he knew something that could help them solve the murder of Tony Rodriguez. They even believed that Marky might have had a hand in the killing. Marky was a good person and a good friend. He lived just four houses away from us. He would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. He was four years older than me. I looked up to him. Not once did he ever suggest that Doug and I do anything that would be considered illegal or immoral. I'm not saying Marky and my brother Davey were saints. They were typical teenagers who chased girls and smoked a little weed, but they both held jobs and worked hard. Marky had a big heart. Across the street lived a family that adopted several mentally disabled children. One of the disabled kids, named Ricky, would spend many hours of his day sitting in a lawn chair on the front porch eating pistachio nuts. Marky would often stop at the grocery store to buy Ricky a bag of pistachios. He would sit on the porch with him, just listening to his stories and socializing. Ricky appreciated that immensely. He would get excited and often talk about his friend Marky coming to see him. That's the kind of person Marky was. Marky would take the time to make you feel special, make you feel like he was your best friend. One evening, 
Marky came to our house after once again having been pulled over and illegally searched by the police. He had just left the store, and there they were, lights flashing and siren blaring. Whoop, whoop! He had all he could take. The harassment was incessant. To make matters worse, his girlfriend, Adele, had just broken up with him. He was distraught and felt like the world was collapsing around him. He didn't stay long in our house. He just wanted to inform us on yet another run-in with the police. As he spoke, he was getting extremely emotional. There was something different about Marky that night. We knew something was clearly wrong, but we didn't know what. He hugged my sister and told us all he was going home. When he drove to his house and walked inside, his mother and father were in the living room watching television on the couch. He walked toward his mother, hugged her, and told her he loved her. He then hugged his dad and told him he loved him. He walked into his bedroom and locked his door behind him. He grabbed his loaded shotgun, sat on the edge of his bed, and lit a cigarette. He turned the gun around and pointed it at his chest. With the cigarette in his left hand, the gun in his right hand, he took a deep breath of air and squeezed the trigger. The sound of the gunshot startled Marky's parents. His father ran to the bedroom door, only to find it was locked. He started yelling his son's name. There was no answer. He lunged at the door several times until he broke it off the hinges. He saw Marky hunched over against the headboard, bleeding badly. He was still alive and clutching the cigarette in his left hand. His father called out loudly to his wife, Call an ambulance! Now! He embraced Marky in his arms. His voice was trembling as he pleaded for his son to hang on. Stay with me, son. Don't you die on me. Help is coming. It was too late for help. Marky took his last breath in his father's arms. We heard the sirens blaring as the police and ambulance passed our house on the way to Marky's. My sister ran outside. Dashing back into our house, she screamed, Oh my God! They're stopping at Marky's house! Like being struck by a bolt of lightning, we shot out the front door and took off running. As we approached the house, we saw Marky's sister and mother in the yard crying uncontrollably. My sister asked them what happened. They tried to speak, but their words were incomprehensible. The only thing that came out was sobbing gibberish. They finally managed to utter enough coherent words for us to piece together that Marky had shot himself. We stood there stunned. We couldn't believe this had happened. It wasn't long before police cars and an ambulance arrived. It seemed like flashing lights were coming from every direction with sirens blazing. The officers pushed us away from the house, insisting we get out of the way while they did their job. We stepped back a reasonable distance, but we weren't about to leave altogether. A dreadful, helpless feeling washed over us. The scene was awful. We tried our best to console each other, but we had lost a good friend, and they had lost a family member. We watched as the paramedics brought Marky's body out on a stretcher and loaded him into the ambulance. They had done their best to revive him, but Marky was pronounced dead on the way to the hospital. Several days later, we attended Marky's funeral. It was a somber and emotional day for everyone, especially our brother Davy. Marky and Davy had been best friends for many years. They were extremely close. We rarely saw one without the other tagging along. Losing Marky was difficult enough, but Doug and I couldn't help but wonder if his death had been partly our fault. We were sure that if Doug hadn't taken the job at the fix-it shop, we would have never gotten wrapped up in Dave Jones's nefarious activities. The cops wouldn't have been incessantly harassing Marky. Marky would still be alive. The guilt was setting in hard for Doug and me. 
making our all-encompassing mental anguish even worse. This whole thing had gone too far. The nightmare needed closure. Two weeks had passed since the funeral and burial of our friend Marky. Rumors were running rampant that Marky might have killed Dave Jones's brother. The preposterous story stemmed from the notion that his conscience had bothered him so much from committing murder that he took his own life. It was hard for us to imagine that Marky could have had a hand in Tony's death. We had never even seen him lose his temper. How could he possibly kill someone? But we had to admit the timing of Tony Rodriguez's death was almost too coincidental. Marky knew us well enough to know that we didn't steal anything. He knew we had been set up and thrown in jail for 18 days against our will. Could he have decided to enact his own revenge? It certainly made Doug and me wonder. The police had no tangible suspects, and the murder was still unsolved. Thankfully, the next day, all our suspicions were laid to rest. An article in our local newspaper had the headline, two men arrested in the beating death of Clarksdale man. The story stated that someone had phoned in a tip to the police department that led to the questioning and arrest of the two individuals. The article gave little information about the details of the death of Tony Rodriguez. We later learned that it was a drug deal gone wrong. David Jones's brother had been a drug dealer. He allegedly sold a bag of cocaine to one of the individuals involved in the beating. The cocaine was mixed with baking soda to make the bag look more full. When the buyers found out they'd been duped, they confronted Tony Rodriguez and beat him to death. We were relieved to know that Marky had nothing to do with that murder. At the same time, we were all the more furious with the police. They went out of their way to intimidate and torment Marky every chance they could. The persecution from the local authorities, combined with his recent breakup with his girlfriend, led to his decision to kill himself. He was in a dark place and made a terrible choice. I wish he would have sought help. I wish he would have opened up to us that fateful night when he came to our house. He must have felt there was no other way to escape from his despair. Chapter 21 Revenge for the Beating It had been weeks since Marky's death, Everybody was still in a somber mood. I got off the school bus and walked home. Across the street from my house, I spotted Ricky on the porch, sitting in his chair. Something didn't look right to me. Ricky was wearing a sling on his arm and his leg was in a cast. My family was fond of Ricky and his family. Ricky's parents fostered kids with Down syndrome. When nobody would care for those special needs kids, Ricky's parents took them in with open arms. Doug and I would often babysit the kids to allow Ricky's parents to run errands, grocery shop, or get away from time to time. Our family instinctively looked after those disabled children. They had an innocence about them, so Doug and I took it upon ourselves to protect them from the neighborhood bullies who preyed on easy targets. As I walked up to the porch where Ricky was sitting, I asked him, What happened, Ricky? With an eye swollen and lip cut, he replied, Three mean boys beat me up. Ricky was about 30 years old and very stout. He had a sweet personality and loved everybody, but he was very vulnerable because he had the mental capacity of a six-year-old. Ricky had wandered off into the woods when he stumbled upon three boys from a nearby neighborhood. They were smoking pot and getting high in an abandoned house. Ricky could smell the marijuana and told the kids, they shouldn't be smoking those smelly cigarettes. Ricky's mind worked like a child's. There was no filter for his words. He honestly spoke what he was thinking. Therefore, he couldn't possibly understand the danger he put himself in when he approached the rundown house. The boys within were known thugs. The most dangerous of the three was a kid named Randy. The other two followed his lead. They would do anything Randy suggested, and... His aim was now turned on Ricky. I once heard that Randy got his kicks by pouring gasoline on cats and then setting them on fire, laughing while they burned. Randy's father was known to beat him, 
and I suppose he would take his anger out on innocent victims. I never hung out with Randy or his thug friends. They lived about five miles away from my house in a public housing project. They rarely came to our neighborhood. These thugs were a particular type of evil. Nobody liked them. They surrounded Ricky in those woods and tormented him. Ricky tried to get away, but Randy beat him with a baseball bat, breaking Ricky's leg. While Ricky crumpled to the ground, Randy continued the beating and broke his collarbone. All three thugs took turns beating Ricky with zero remorse. They left Ricky in the woods alone, unable to walk. A nearby neighbor heard Ricky's muffled cries for help. Ricky's mom came outside and confirmed what Ricky told me. I asked him what she planned to do about this. She explained that they filed a police report and the boys would soon be picked up and arrested. She would take them to court. I explained to her that those kids were ruthless thugs. She could not let Ricky out of her sight. If those kids ever found him alone, they wouldn't hesitate to give him another beating. The thugs didn't have a moral compass. They didn't care how much harm they unleashed on others, especially the defenseless. Doug saw me talking to Ricky and his mom. He walked across the street, and we filled him in on what had happened. He was now just as furious as I was. We both wanted revenge. We knew the three bullies walked past the store located above the fix-it shop every morning before school. We decided to wait at the store the next morning and confront them about the beating. As we always took Charles to school with us, we needed to fill him in on our plan. He became just as enraged as us and wanted in on the revenge. We had to take matters into our own hands. In tough neighborhoods, you look out for each other. You don't wait for justice to be served, especially when justice has been proven corrupt. The next morning, we waited on the sidewalk next to a Coke machine. We saw Randy and his thug buddies walking toward us, laughing without a care in the world. As Doug, Charles, and I crossed the street to confront them, I told Doug and Charles that I wanted Randy. They just had to make sure the other two didn't jump in. I wanted this to be a fair fight. I wanted him to pay for the beating he gave Ricky. The thugs saw us approaching and stopped walking. I called out to Randy, You must feel like a real badass, beating a mentally disabled guy. How about you pick on someone that can fight back? Randy didn't hesitate. He threw the bag down that he held in his left hand. With his right hand, he reached around his back and pulled out a snub-nosed thirty-eight caliber revolver. He pointed the gun at my head and walked toward me slowly, asking, How bad do I look now? He held the gun two inches from my left temple and started circling me, holding the gun close to my head. When he got to my right side, Doug spoke up. Takes a real coward to bring a gun to a fist fight. For a brief moment, Randy shifted his eyes to Doug. I saw an opportunity and took it. I pushed his arm straight up in the air. The gun fired, and I managed to take it out of his hand. Doug kicked the gun into the street, and the fight began. I lit into Randy with all I had. He took at least three blows to his face and one to his temple that knocked him out. Doug and Charles were fighting with the other two thugs. It was an all-out brawl. All I could think about was the beating Ricky suffered from that baseball bat. My rage would not subside. I seriously wanted to kill this low-life thug. I picked Randy's lifeless body up over my head and slammed him onto the sidewalk, head first into the concrete. We were all so wrapped up in the fight that none of us noticed the car idling at the stop sign. The driver was a teacher from our school who had just witnessed everything, except the part where Randy held a gun to my head. The teacher sped through the intersection, slammed on his brakes, and jumped out to end the fight. Randy was motionless. We thought he might be dead. The teacher could see Randy was unresponsive. He was bleeding badly from the head. The teacher knew an ambulance would take too long to arrive, so he picked Randy up and put him in his car. One of Randy's friends grabbed the gun and took off running. The other thug jumped into the car with the teacher and Randy's limp body. They rushed to the hospital. The injury was serious. We thought Randy might not survive his head injury. Doug, Charles, and I went to school. 
I was seriously worried. My rage finally got the better of me. I had gone too far this time. I was sitting in class when my teacher informed me that I had to go to the principal's office. I obviously knew why, so I was ready to confess and take my punishment. To my surprise, a juvenile officer was waiting for me. He told me to turn around and put my hands behind my back. Once again, I was handcuffed. The officer explained to me that Randy was in a coma. His brain was swelling from the injury I inflicted. He might not make it. He informed me that I was under arrest for assault and battery. I was about to be hauled off to jail, so I asked the principal if he would call my mom and tell her what happened. Mom met me at the jail. This time they allowed her to sign me out, without bond. The fight was my fault. I started it. Nobody was to be blamed but myself. I was fighting as a vigilante, but my rage had turned me into a thug. Every fight I was in involved bullies that preyed on the weak and innocent. But I learned the hard way that you can't fight them all. Bullies are a dime a dozen in poor neighborhoods. They linger on every street corner. If I couldn't find a way to control my temper, I'd eventually meet my match and get seriously hurt. It doesn't matter how tough you think you are, eventually you will run across someone with nothing to lose. Those are the most dangerous kind of thugs. Randy survived, although he spent two weeks in intensive care from the head injury. My court hearing was set to face the charge of assault and battery. Much to my surprise, Randy ran away from home, did not show up for court, and the charge was dismissed. I assume he knew that if this went to court, they'd find out that he had pulled a gun on me. My actions would then be considered self-defense. The fight was noted in my juvenile file and would be brought up later in court. Again, I was not proud of fighting. I felt no victory or glory from doing what I did. I had rage and anger deep inside me that I couldn't control. I was a walking time bomb. I needed help. I'll admit, at this point in my life, I was a dangerous kid on a self-destructive path. Chapter 22 Our Day in Court Finally, after months of waiting, our day had come to face our accusers in court. Doug and I got fresh haircuts the day before, and we dressed up in the suits our brother Ron had bought for us. We remained silent on the drive to the courthouse. I was so despondent that I couldn't even remember if I ate breakfast that morning. We met Charles in the lobby of the courthouse. Our attorneys wanted to have a private meeting with the three of us before the trial began. They informed us that we'd be tried together. All the charges were identical except for the charge of selling marijuana that I had pending against me. Since we'd been together when the alleged crimes happened, it had been deemed unnecessary to try us individually. We took our seats in the courtroom. The place was packed. Word had gotten around town that this was an interesting case, to say the least. The attorney representing the ACLU was present and seated with our attorneys. We saw David Jones sitting behind the district attorney, with several others including the chief of police and the head of the vice squad, Bob Roberts. It was crystal clear that Dave Jones was in cahoots with the law. How could they sink so low and abuse their authority to such an extent? Our distaste for Jones was enormous. There were many character witnesses in the room ready to testify on our behalf. My teacher, Mr. Riley, Shaky the bus driver, Doug's manager from the stable's steakhouse, and at least twenty more faces of honest people we knew. The judge entered the courtroom, and, to our relief, it was not Judge Cajano. He was a young, bearded man named Judge Smith. He had built a reputation for being honest and fair. The judge greeted everyone in the courtroom and asked if the attorneys were ready to begin their opening statements. The prosecuting attorney went first. He presented his case with some truth, but he twisted all of it into hogwash. He verbally painted a picture of how Doug, Charles, and I were nothing more than truant juveniles who made a hobby of stealing and selling stolen goods. It's hard to sit there and listen to all his lies. He told the people in the courtroom 
that we were out-of-control bullies driven by hot tempers. He mentioned the fight I got into with Tim while we were incarcerated. Of course, he emphasized that I started it. He also mentioned the 10-day suspension Doug and I received because of another fight that we instigated. He pointed out that one of the victims was hospitalized with the injuries I inflicted. The prosecutor continued to point out that, on another, more recent occasion, I was arrested for assault. The victim suffered a brain injury and was hospitalized for over two weeks. He told the people in attendance that he would prove we were nothing but thugs and thieves who deserved the full punishment allowed by law. It made me sick hearing all that, knowing I had been responsible for those fights and the thugs being hospitalized. The prosecutor did a great job making Doug and me look like we were violent deviants. His statement was a well-orchestrated, twisted version of the events, designed to get the real perpetrators off the hook. It made my stomach turn. Our attorney, Mr. Randolph, then took the podium and argued in our defense. He explained that one of the boys had been hired help at the fix-it shop. The other two defendants were simply caught in the middle of a sting operation that went terribly wrong, a sting that had been conducted by the Clarksdale Police Department. Randolph asserted, Because these boys had accidentally found the hidden surveillance camera, an underhanded and calculated decision was made to set them up with fraudulent charges. He continued, The purpose of the setup was to keep the boys silent until the sting operation was completed. Their incarceration was not only against their will, it was a gross misuse of authority. The fact that police detectives were afraid that these boys could tip off others in their neighborhood and blow the cover off the operation prematurely did not in any way, shape, or form justify the gross miscarriage of constitutional rights. Our lawyer then pointedly addressed the judge. These boys are not criminals. The fights the prosecutor speaks of were something they were goaded into and had no bearing on this case. The fighting was a direct result of the stress and pressures unlawfully inflicted upon these kids. I will prove today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that these boys are innocent. He turned and looked at the prosecution's table. And not only are these defendants innocent, but there are officials in this courtroom who should subsequently be brought up on criminal charges. He returned to our table and sat down with an air of disgust. The prosecutor then called a man named Mr. Brake to the stand. Mr. Brake was the store manager of our local Walmart. One of the crimes on the laundry list of bogus charges against us was the theft of two Murray bikes from Walmart on March 4th. Prosecutor, Mr. Brake, did you report the theft of two Murray bicycles on March 4th? Mr. Brake, no, sir, I reported the bikes stolen on March 7th. Prosecutor, in the petition in front of me, it states the bikes were stolen on March 4th and sold to the fix-it shop on the same day, March 4th. Are you certain about the date these bikes were stolen? Mr. Brake, yes, I'm positive the bikes were stolen on March 7th. That was my 10th wedding anniversary. Because of filing the report and being detained by the police, I was late getting home. We lost our dinner reservation. My wife was really upset. That's something you don't forget. I told Judge Caggiano at the last hearing that I was correct about the date, but she said I must have been confused. She took a recess and allowed the documents to be altered to make the dates match up. Mr. Randolph, Your Honor, owing to the conflicting evidence you just heard, I move to dismiss this charge against the three defendants. Judge Smith. Motion granted. This charge is now dismissed. Everyone in the courtroom fell completely silent. In the blink of an eye, with a wave of a hand, the judge had dismissed the charge for theft of the bikes. Doug and I knew right then that this judge was not corrupt. We had a legitimate chance to beat the false charges. The prosecutor called the next witness. Mr. Daniel Farmer to the stand, please. Mr. Farmer was the owner of the Alice Chalmers riding mower that Doug and I picked up from his house. Prosecutor, Mr. Farmer, did you file a police report on March 22nd stating that your riding mower had been stolen? Mr. Farmer, yes, I did. Prosecutor, could you tell the court, please, when you first noticed your mower was missing? Mr. Farmer, I noticed it was gone when I got home on the evening of March 21st. 
prosecutor. Thank you. No further questions at this time. The attorney for the defense rose for his turn to question. Mr. Randolph. Mr. Farmer, if your mower was missing on the 21st of March, why did you not report it missing until the 22nd? Mr. Farmer. I wasn't going to report it at all. Several days before it was missing, I had called Mr. Jones at the fix-it shop to arrange for him to pick up my mower. I wanted to see if he could repair it at a reasonable cost. I explained to Mr. Jones that I had lost the key to the lock, so he understood that the lock would need to be cut to move the mower. When I noticed the mower missing, I assumed Mr. Jones had picked my mower up and taken it to his shop. The next day, I got a call from Mr. Jones explaining that some kids just dropped off a rare Alice Chalmers mower at his shop to sell. He told me he thought this might be my mower. I told him my mower was gone, so yes, it must be mine. He told me the same kids had been arrested that morning for another theft. He wanted me to file a police report. He claimed that was the only way he could get his money back. So I filed the report, and here I am, and I would like to get my mower back. At this point, things were going poorly for the prosecution. The judge dismissed Mr. Farmer. Next, he called Dave Jones to the stand. Everyone could see that Dave was nervous. He realized his scam was unfolding. Dave Jones was about to be questioned by all three attorneys. He was sweating profusely. Mr. Randolph. Mr. Jones, are you the manager or owner of the business called the Fix-It Shop on Woodmore Boulevard? Dave Jones. Yes, sir. Mr. Randolph. Did you place a newspaper ad in the classifieds offering a delivery driver job? Dave Jones. No, sir. Mr. Randolph. Do you own a pair of red bolt cutters? Dave Jones. No, sir, I do not. Mr. Randolph. You see these three boys sitting together behind me, Doug, Charles, and Freddie. Did you hire any of these boys to make deliveries for you at any time? Dave Jones. No, sir, I did not. Mr. Randolph. I wish to remind you, Mr. Jones, that you are under oath, and right now you are treading a fine line. Your Honor, this man is lying. Please allow me to submit these photos into evidence. He handed them up to the judge and then resumed questioning. Mr. Jones, let me show you three items that might refresh your memory. Although you and I know full well that you are not telling the truth, these items refute the lies you just told. Here's a classified ad dated February 14, 1982. It reads, Wanted, Delivery Man, Full Time, Call 645-8900, The Fix-It Shop. Here's a receipt from the Clarksdale Co-op that you left on the counter after purchasing a pair of red bolt cutters. And here's a picture of those bolt cutters with writing down the handle in bold letters saying, Fix-It Shop. Randolph held the newspaper up for all to see and then continued, Here's another receipt from the co-op where Doug filled his van with gas and purchased a two-inch tow ball that he charged to your account. Mr. Jones, I have spoken with the manager of the co-op. He is in this courtroom today. He explained to me that he called you after the boys left on the morning of March 22nd. During that call, you confirmed that Doug, in fact, did work for you thereupon allowing and validating the charges for the gas and tow ball. Randolph started to walk back to his chair. Then, turning back around, he said, I have a few more questions for you, Mr. Jones. They might be difficult for you to answer, seeing as how you seem to be suffering a severe loss of memory. I'll remind you once again, you are under oath. Perhaps that'll help toggle your memory. Have you been arrested in the past? Do you have a police record? Any prior arrests at all? and if so, please explain. Dave Jones turned pale. He knew he was cornered like the rat he truly was. He looked to the judge pleadingly, as if he might find some help or support there. No such luck. Then he looked to the prosecuting attorney. His goose was cooked. None of the officials who he thought were on his side moved an inch to aid him in his time of distress. Nobody there was going to help him. The judge impatiently spoke. Mr. Jones, answer the questions. Dave responded, Without looking at my FBI file, I cannot answer your questions accurately. FBI file? 
We were amazed at the level of criminal guilt we were witnessing. We knew the tide had turned in our favor. Mr. Randolph, let me give you a little help. Tell me if this is accurate. You've been arrested for burglary, home invasion, car theft, and prison escape. You're currently on probation because of these crimes. Sound familiar? Any of this ring a bell? Randolph didn't let up. Please explain to me who hired you to run the fix-it shop. What is your connection to the person who landed you the job? Dave Jones. I was hired by Bob Franks, commanding officer for the Clarksdale Vice Squad. Mr. Randolph. How do you know Mr. Franks? Dave Jones. He's married to my sister. Mr. Randolph. Your Honor, I respectfully request a motion that all the charges against these boys be dismissed. It's proven without a doubt that this man and others associated with the sting operation fabricated every crime these boys are charged with. They were railroaded, unjustly accused, and incarcerated. He raised his right index finger in the air to emphasize his next point. But I propose that dropping the charges and letting these innocent boys go free is not enough. I furthermore request that this man be arrested for lying under oath, and his partners in this heinous series of crimes should be arraigned as well. With that, Randolph triumphantly returned to his place at the defendant's table. Dave Jones lowered his face down into his hands and started weeping. When he finally raised his head and spoke, Your Honor, I'd like you to give me a minute to tell the truth about these boys. That was a surprise to everyone in the courtroom, especially us. Judge Smith nodded. Proceed. Dave Jones, a man we'd come to see as the lowest of the low, apparently felt some guilt for what he'd done to us. He began to tell the truth. These boys are guilty of nothing. I hired Doug to haul off the stolen goods to our warehouse. Everything was going fine until Will Walters showed up one day to collect the rent. I told the boys to go to the back room. That was when Freddy discovered the surveillance camera in the curtained-off area of the back room. I panicked and called my brother-in-law, Bob Franks, and asked him what to do. We never meant to cause harm to the boys. Doug and I didn't believe that last bit of garbage for a second. Dave Jones's actions hurt us. He damaged us more than anyone ever had. He didn't care at all about us. None of his cohorts did. Jones continued bearing his soul. We simply needed to get them out of the picture so the whole operation wouldn't be blown. That's when we got the idea to have them arrested. I sent them to Mr. Farmer's house to get the Alice Chalmers mower. The plan was for Bob Franks to arrest them while they were picking up the mower, but he didn't get there fast enough to make the arrest, so we came up with Plan B. I made arrangements with a guy from Kentucky who I knew was sitting on a hot ATV. I sent the boys to Kentucky to meet the man at a store and pick up the ATV. We arranged for the police to be waiting for them and to make an arrest. Everything was going as planned until the ACLU became involved. We were forced to let the boys out on bail, and I had to manufacture more charges to have them rearrested because the operation was not completed. By this point, everyone in the courtroom was disgusted with Dave Jones. Mr. Randolph. What about the marijuana? Did you ask Freddy to purchase the marijuana for you? And did you give him the money to do it? Dave Jones. Yes, I gave Freddy ten dollars and asked him to buy the weed with it. When he returned, I paid him ten dollars for doing the job. I purchased the weed to smoke it myself, but I knew the camera had recorded everything, so I took about half of the pot for myself and turned in the other half as evidence. The video was then altered to make him appear like he was selling me a bag of weed. It never showed the part where I asked him to buy it and the part where I gave him the $10 to make the initial purchase. We were able to manipulate the video to appear as if the boys were dropping off stolen goods. The manipulated video was needed to convince Judge Caggiano to grant permission to detain them longer. We convinced Judge Caggiano these boys were thieves. Mr. Randolph do you have any remorse at all for the enormous amount of damage you callously and cruelly have caused these kids and their families? Dave Jones. None of us intended to hurt these boys. 
They simply needed to be contained for a few days until we completed the operation. Mr. Randolph, oh, stop it. You insult my intelligence. I am sick of all your lies. Dave Jones, we ran out of options. We had no choice. We couldn't think of any other way to get them out of circulation on such a short notice. Mr. Randolph, oh, that's too bad. I feel for you. I really do. You make me sick. Dave Jones, it was only 18 days, not 18 years. I know it was wrong, and yes, I feel sorry for these boys. I know they were good kids, just doing the best they can under rough conditions. I don't want to go back to prison for lying under oath, so I'm not lying anymore. I'd rather go back to prison than to have it on my conscience that these boys got locked up for something they didn't do. Mr. Randolph, they've already been locked up for things they didn't do. I hope that sits uncomfortably on your conscience. No further questions, Your Honor. Judge Smith. Mr. Randolph, your motion to dismiss all charges is granted. Please note all charges are dismissed and the boys are free to go. I will need to see the district attorney and his staff in my chambers in 15 minutes. The court is now dismissed. With a slam of the gavel, it was over. All the charges were dropped. Hallelujah! The people in the courtroom were stunned. They couldn't believe what had just transpired. Many people walked up to Charles, Doug, and me, apologizing for the actions of the police. Some were apologizing for doubting our innocence. Doug and I stayed silent. We didn't feel like there was anything to say. We didn't celebrate. We were just utterly relieved. We thanked our attorneys and those who showed up as character witnesses to testify in our defense. We left the courtroom and made our way to the car. We were a mix of emotions, the strongest being our eagerness to go home. The entire experience had severely damaged us. We wanted to believe it was finally over, but things had been going so badly for us that we didn't know what to believe or whom to trust. We were still uncertain that it was over. Chapter 23 Coping with Reality The judge had dismissed all the charges against us. There weren't any more court proceedings looming over us. Doug, Charles, and I were free. We desired, more than anything, to get back to some semblance of a normal day-to-day -day existence. But at that point, we weren't certain what that even looked like. Doug, Charles, and I still had one major decision to make. The ACLU, helping to prove our innocence, wanted to take this case further. We had an admission of guilt on the part of Dave Jones. We also had all the evidence needed to prove that the police department— District Attorney and Judge Caggiano worked together to violate our rights, although we felt the manipulated video duped Judge Caggiano. The ACLU wanted to make all of them pay the price for their unlawful actions. They proposed filing a multi-million dollar lawsuit on our behalf. They explained to us that, in their opinion, this case would be a slam dunk. They were positive that there was no chance of us losing— there was one catch, however. Doug, Charles, and I would have to go back to court if we agreed to the ACLU's proposal. None of us had any desire to stir things up and, in effect, go through the nightmare all over again. Without hesitation, we all declined the offer to sue. During the horrible ordeal we'd only recently been exonerated from, we'd lost a good friend to suicide. We'd lost our dog. We'd lost trust in authority figures. We'd lost much of our childhood innocence. Our scars weren't visible, but we would wear them for the rest of our lives. No one could have possibly understood the emotional and mental damage we had endured. The three of us were walking time bombs, ready to explode at any moment. We should have gotten professional help to cope with our anger, regret, sadness, and a handful of other emotions. Doug, Charles, and I continued to go to school and work, but still, we became further withdrawn from friends and family. We couldn't help it. We felt completely numb and hollow inside. Most kids our age were dating and building relationships. 
We watched them get excited about school dances and upcoming football games, the usual things that fill the interests of high school students. We didn't share the same excitement. We felt like outsiders in our own world. We were damaged goods. I guess, looking back, our detachment to society and life itself was our silent cry for help. Days slowly turned into weeks, and our lives were, for the most part, uneventful. We kept to ourselves, but we were on an emotional path to self-destruction. All we needed was for someone to light the fuse. It wouldn't take much for us to explode. As it turned out, it wouldn't be long before a reason to detonate arrived. It was an ordinary day at school. The ending bell had rung, and all the students were making their usual mad scramble to their cars and buses. I decided to go over to Dale's house a few miles away from our home. Dale, my classmate, had asked me to hang out at his house after school. He said he had something really cool he wanted to show me. Once I got there, I sat down on the top step of their porch. He came outside with a thirty thirty Winchester rifle in his hands. Dale said his father gave it to him for his birthday. Dale and his father were avid hunters. Dale loved his father. They had a close relationship, a closeness I never shared with my dad. I envied that. Dale showed me his gun and pointed out several features. He showed me how to load it with ammunition while carefully placing six shells in the chamber. He explained the lever action that allowed the gun to be cocked and discharged. I suppose I found it interesting, though a little unsettling. I didn't know much about guns. We never had one in the house growing up. Dale offered it to me, suggesting I hold the gun. I grabbed it around the metal barrel. Apparently, that was a mistake. Dale quickly reacted, taking the gun away from me. Never grab a gun by the metal. Always grab the butt or the stock. He placed it correctly back in my hand. Your hands will leave fingerprints on the metal. That makes for extra work. I'll have to oil the metal to clean the fingerprints off the gun. Dale took the gun back again, got up, and told me he would be right back. He was going to get his cleaning kit and show me how to clean the barrel. Dale returned with the gun and the cleaning kit. He proceeded to apply oil on a rag and wiped the gun down. After doing that, he asked if I'd like something to drink. I said, sure. He leaned the rifle against the wall and went back inside the house to get us a couple of Cokes out of the refrigerator. It was in those moments, alone on that porch, that a horrible urge came over me. I thought, here's my chance to end all the emotional suffering. It was like a demonic voice inside my brain took over, and I couldn't stop it. I don't know what triggered my emotions or where that voice came from. I knew better than to ever consider ending my own life. But my thoughts had been so cloudy in the wake of my ordeal that nothing made sense. Looking back, I guess this spark of desperation must have been similar to what Marky experienced when he ended his life. I took the gun into my hands and flicked the safety off. I put the stock of the gun on the porch step below me. As I positioned the barrel under my chin, Dale walked out the front door. I hadn't heard him coming. I'm not sure it would have mattered if I had. I pulled the trigger. The gun clicked. Dale, utterly shocked, snatched the gun out of my hands, yelling, Dude, what the fuck's wrong with you? His eyes were bulging wide open in disbelief. Holy crap, man! If I hadn't unloaded that gun when I went to get the cleaning kit, you would be dead! I had crossed the line. I had tried to kill myself. I think I went into a state of shock. I completely lost my composure and broke down in tears. Right there on those front porch steps, I unloaded all my fears and insecurities onto Dale. I rehashed all the events that took place during the sting operation. I told him about my dog, Blackie, and how my friend Marky killed himself. I mentioned all the fights and all the drama with the court system, 
The floodgates had opened, and nothing could stop the outpouring of my soul. All Dale could do was sit there with me and listen. He was also in his junior year of high school, but even at that age, Dale was wise enough to understand that I was having a mental breakdown. As I walked those couple of miles home from his house, he phoned my mother. She needed to know what just happened. Dale was genuinely concerned about me. When I arrived home, Mom instructed me to sit down at the kitchen table. I needed to listen to what she had to say. We had a long talk about the many things that were disturbing me so much. What bothered her the most, obviously, was my attempted suicide at Dale's house. At that point, she knew it was clear that I wasn't able to work my way through the mountain of problems weighing me down without professional help. She said I needed to talk to a psychiatrist. She suggested that Doug and I both seek an evaluation. The next day, my mother was able to get us an appointment to see a mental health specialist. The entire time frame of the events that took place at the fix-it shop lasted only two weeks. Our two-week stint working for Dave Jones resulted in our incarceration and 18-day confinement. We recovered from the physical damage we sustained while in jail, but it took 12 months of therapy to straighten out the psychological damage we'd suffered from the entire ordeal. Doug and I met with the psychiatrist twice a month for almost a year. It worked for us. We were learning how to deal with our emotions. Charles, on the other hand, opted not to seek therapy. Doug and I both begged him to seek professional help. We saw positive results within ourselves. We were convinced that psychiatric help would be just as good for Charles, too. But he wouldn't hear it. He insisted that he didn't need it. He wasn't going to lower himself by talking with a shrink. Chapter 24 The Rest of the Story Doug recovered nicely. He graduated from high school and started a job as a route salesman for the Coke Company. Doug was both frugal and smart with his money. Over time, he bought five rental houses and opened a farm supply business. A few years later, he sold everything he owned, moved to Savannah, Georgia, and started a successful salvage operation. He married and had a child. I, Freddie, went on to finish high school. With Doug's help, I landed a job with Coke in route sales. A couple of years later, I moved to the Washington, D.C. area with my brother Ron. There I took a job as a shipping and receiving supervisor for a printing company. Some years later, I moved back to Tennessee, married, and had kids. I got a job as a delivery driver for United Parcel Service. I retired at 50 years old after 26 years of service. I was never involved in another legal issue. Most recently, as you can see, I decided to write a book about my teenage experiences in Clarksdale back in the 1980s. Charles never received any professional help for dealing with his emotions and mental issues following involvement with the sting operation. He instead turned to drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism for his pent-up mental anguish. Charles worked construction jobs here and there. He was in and out of prisons his entire adult life. Even so, I've always regarded him as a good guy, a man with a decent heart. I believe he made the wrong choice in refusing psychiatric help. Things may have worked out better for him had he done it. The district attorney at the time of our criminal case lost his battle for re-election owing to the events surrounding the fix-it shop sting operation. Needless to say, I was glad to see that happen. It served him right. Ms. Caggiano continued as a juvenile judge. She was never challenged for her involvement in violating our rights. I was not happy to know that. I believe she should have received some form of punishment. At the very least, she could have apologized to Doug, Charles, and me for holding us without clear evidence. Dave Jones, the ex-convict at the center of all the trouble, turned out to be a pretty smart man. When he accepted the position of an undercover agent working for the police department, he had an agreement drawn up to prevent any criminal punishment against him while acting as an agent for the city. It was later discovered that Dave Jones had been using city funds earmarked for buying the stolen property for the fix-it shop to buy drugs for his personal use. But, having signed the agreement that protected him, 
he couldn't be charged with any wrongdoing. Davy, brother of Doug and Freddie, was involved in an auto accident some years later. His neck was broken in seven places, paralyzing him for the rest of his life. Ron, brother of Doug and Freddie, compiled 25 years of distinguished service in the military. He retired as a sergeant major, the highest enlisted rank a soldier can receive. He continues to be the rock of the family. And life goes on. On a side note, shortly after the infamous sting operation collapsed, Dave Jones's indoor flea market actually opened its doors to the public. Dave Jones was no longer involved. The city took over and allowed the victims of the stolen goods to recover their property. Whatever they didn't claim was auctioned off to the highest bidder. We found out later that Dave had spent over $35,000 purchasing the stolen items. He never intended to use his warehouse as a flea market. It was one of the many fabricated lies he used to prevent us from becoming suspicious. The city recouped the $35,000. I'd like to add a quote that was said by the most famous entertainer ever to walk this earth. It seems fitting to end my story. Truth is like the sun. You can shut it out for a time, but it ain't going away. Elvis Presley Acknowledgements I want to thank Chris P. James from Hendersonville, Tennessee, for helping inspire me to write this book. Chris was instrumental in helping me structure my manuscript into a novel. Also, I want to thank Tracy Walner from Ocala, Florida, for creating the artwork and design of the book. Tracy spent many hours helping me expand my story and getting it published. I would also like to thank Joel Cash for hiring me as a driver for United Parcel Service in 1989. All I ever asked for in life was a hand up, not a handout. Joel Cash offered me that hand up by offering me a well-paying job with a great company. That job, combined with a strong work ethic, enabled my kids to never have to experience the struggle of living in poverty. I am forever grateful for the opportunity I was given to work for such a great company for over 26 years. This has been The Fix-It Shop, written by Friedrich Wilhelm, narrated by Chris Abernathy.